here we are at undisclosed location, the compound. We will not live in the pod. We will not eat the bugs. There are more important things to worry about than matching socks. And, um... This is what they this is what they don't want you to be. This is where they don't want you. This is this is what they this is what they took from us. I was reading Jelaine's um, wiki blog thing, just reading through it. There's so much stuff on there. If you, if you don't cyber savior, if you don't if you don't know it already, it's amazing. Very dense, very full of high concept shit. You know the good shit, full of the good shit. Shouts out Jelaine, and Jelaine said something about. Uh, Oh god, I've actually completely forgotten what I was going to talk about because I got too excited about the website that I saw it on. Um, oh yeah, RSS. That like RSS is the peak of like the internet and computing or whatever because it's like a feed of everything you want, just like social media, but it's completely owned and curated by yourself. There's no bloat, there's no advertising, there's no tracking. It runs locally, it's open source, blah, 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 blah. blah. It's like uh, standardized. It's basically perfect. And um, I, I agree. And I'm trying to make my... To be more RSS pilled. Here's... You know, I shouldn't have recorded this facing my face. Uh, I haven't shaved since I got to Estonia. And I already had kind of a, a full beard when I got here. So it's getting fuller. I'm, I'm getting pretty fucking beard pilled. Uh, yeah, I'm using my phone to type now. That's the level I'm on. Okay, I'm going to stop this recording so that I can switch over the camera and point it in the direction of my computer so you can see my people I follow in my RSS feed. Okay, so this is my news boat, uh, as you can see. Look, Vim keys, Vim, Vim, JK, isn't that cool? Uh, but uh, here's the, the general people I follow. We got Crap Futures, we got Cyber Savior, we got Biosejo Computanzas, um, which is pretty good. Um, we got Luke Smith. I don't really, I just sort of followed him because I was like, I mean, he has an RSS feed. Uh, Artix Linux News, important. I can keep track of stuff. XXIIVV, Low Tech Magazine, 100 Rabbits, No Tech Magazine, The Raul Neo Forum Text Board, um, so this is just an ISS feed of everything people, every time there's a new post, look, like this one, Forsen, 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 it go, goes to get sent to this RSS. Uh, so I don't, you know, have to check back on the website constantly and go through every single thread. I just go here and I'm like, uh, oh, hey, chat, uh, whoops, chat, okay, um, interesting, blah, 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 right, whatever. Midnight Pub. I was more into this a while ago, as you can see, I haven't really read any of this for a while. I kind of got bored of Midnight Pub. Um, but anyway, my own RSS feed, which is really what I came here to talk about, um, but I'll get back to that. This is mainly, I just follow this so I can test it. Every time I update it, I can just like make sure that the RSS went out. Miso, which I don't think actually works anymore. Simplifier, who hasn't posted anything for, like, years. Oops, I did not I pressed the wrong button there. Um, Electro.pizza, who also hasn't posted anything for a really long time. Bismuth Garden. Uh, I, I, anyway, most of this stuff doesn't really matter. The point being, uh, RSS is great. And as you can see, I have... Look, this is me. That's no thank you, that's me. And I have my own RSS thing that you can follow... And you can read my newest blog post, completely garbled thoughts about post-industrial life and all sorts of garbled things that's all garbled and bad, posted for me, which you will see if I open it up in a computer, is a big, long text post about various different things. 
going all the way from uh, how I think post-industrial society would have a relation to food to how I think um, it's uh, if you're an anti-capitalist you should take a look at pre-capitalist societies for inspiration not just be inspired by uh, you know books uh, about uh, you know how uh, sort of um, uh, they actually put a pretty put it pretty well in the blog post um, um, blah 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 they will point to actually existing socialism or something similar in the form of many modern attempts at escaping capitalism the classics are all there right all the revolutions you've heard of and some you haven't they're more than ready to critique and take inspiration from and argue about the merits of these attempts that's great and all but isn't it missing out on something even bigger if you want to look at actual examples of people living without capitalism why ignore the tens of thousands of years that everyone did there you go um, then I respond to some criticisms of anarchism uh, then I, uh, and then I talk about subsistence farming, and then I, uh, go on a big long rant about veganism for no reason, then I'm like, uh, actually that was kind of bad and I shouldn't have been moaning about veganism, uh, there's nothing wrong with being vegan, every, all the vegans I know are nice people, blah blah blah, uh, and then I'm like, actually I'm kind of worthless, Hey, look, here's a big hole in my ideology. Um, and uh, here's why consciousness is a virus and we can never win until it's eliminated. And then the blog post just sort of ends. Um, uh, and you can see stuff like this. I, I, I think you should read this blog post is what I'm saying. I'm pretty happy with it. It's kind of winding and stream of consciousness -y because that's how I wrote it and I think it is fun to read and you might you might get something out of it so go on my blog by the way my blog if you don't know is no thank you the other zeros dot neo cities dot org um, uh, yeah you'll find it there's a big button that says blog post on it um, so that's cool and you should also explore the rest of the Denver Webering which is also really cool, and I haven't, you know, it's not like, you. the thing about blogs and personal websites and whatever, is that RSS feeds exist, and that way, you can just follow all the people you like on RSS, and you don't have to bother, like, checking in on them every single day or whatever, they probably won't update every single day, and so on, and it's all good. And honestly, I wish that I had more interesting people to follow, but I don't right now, because it's a little tricky to find them. Uh, which is why I, I thought the Denpa web ring was a good idea in the first place, because it's the easier it is to find cool people, the better, and web rings are one of the best ways to make it easy to find cool people. Um, and everyone in the Denpa web ring is cool. Uh, so... Is that now you may notice I have this open in another tab. I have been learning UXN. Um, I do hope one day to make a video about UXN. Um, if you're not aware of what UXN is, to briefly explain it, um, the story behind the origin story, the superhero origin story of UXN. Damn, I'm, I'm about to run out of battery. Uh, fuck, what do I do? What do I do? What do you do when you're about to run out of battery, guys? The solution plug it in. I've been trying to explain this to people for years, they just don't get it. When you're about to run out of battery, plug it in. I'm going to plug it in real quick. Okay, so to briefly explain the origin story of UXN, again, I do plan to make a whole video about this, but I want to be more familiar with the, the just general stuff about it before I do. But um, I've known about this for a long time. The, f the, the, the origin story is these blokes, well, I don't know if they're there they would appreciate the term blokes. I use the term blokes as a gender neutral thing, but these 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 people, <laughs> they live on a boat, right? And they're software engineers, software programmers, not engineers. What am I talking about? Okay, I'm very over caffeinated right now, so I'm not making much sense. There's some people and they live on a boat, right? This is the, the, the basic premise. There's some people, they like to do computer stuff and they live on a boat and they want to make programs that are um, 
that can be run on many different types of systems, right? But the problem is uh, like cross-platform programs, right? And they were using Electron. The problem with Electron is that uh, it's very bloated and on a boat they didn't have much power from their solar cells so they can't run like high power fast modern computers um, and that makes it difficult to work with Electron and it also requires an internet connection uh, to, to use an Electron app which is not practical if you live on a boat so they decided to create their own solution to this which is similar to Electron not really actually but it, it's similar in the sense that uh, rather than programming, you know, having to port your program to various different operating systems, you have one platform that can be ported to multiple different operating systems, and then you write your program for that platform. Except instead of Electron being a, like a web browser type thing, um, the platform is uh, UXN, which is a virtual machine for creating small toys and games and things like this. Uh, it's supposed to be computing within limits, so it's very restrictive in terms of, like, power uh, and memory and stuff like this. Like, you can really only make fairly small things with it. Um, and uh, in order to program for UXN, for the, uh, the, 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 com uh, the computer that it's being virtualized is called the Vavara uh, computer. Um, and the programming language is called UXN TAL, or just a lot of people just call it TAL for short. Um, and uh, so you, it's kind of inspired by Forth, but it's an assembly language for this uh, Vavara computer. Um, um, and uh, and that's it. And then you can write a program for Vav for in in TAL and run it via the virtual machine and then the, the virtual machine itself is very simple and it's been ported already to like all the basic things that you would want it to be ported to it's on you know mac linux windows 64 windows 32 bit um uh ds um <laughs> it's, it's on a bunch of different shit uh I, I, you know maybe i can find out all of the things it's been ported to uh maybe uh, here, let, let me see all of the different UXN versions. Um, uh, there's Mac, Windows, Android, Haiku OS, um, Linux, multiple different Linuxes, Amiga. Um, I don't know what the fuck Essence is, but that exists. Uh, there's various different languages of UXN, like been there's a there's there's it's it, the Game Boy Advance, the Nintendo DS, original Game Boy, which isn't complete yet. Playdate, I don't know what that is. DOS uh, has been started. PS Vita, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico has been started. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones that are in, in the works, like Teletype, I don't even know what this is, ESP32, don't know what that is, iOS, um, STM32, STM32 Duino, I don't know what any of these are, IBM PC, Nokia N9, N900, um, there's even a, a port of the emulator for LibRetro, uh, there's a web version as well, there's actually two different web versions, I'm pretty sure, uh, Right, the, what I'm saying is, this the, the UXN emulator is very simple, that's the whole point, right? It's a very simple system that's easy to re-implement by one person, which Electron is not. It's proprietary, they have to do it, they're not, you know, they're never going to make Electron run on the fucking DS or whatever. But UXN is very easy to re-implement. Um, and there are lots of different things that have been made for UXN, it's still early days, but here are some examples. There's a graphical text editor. There's a sprite sheet editor. There's a drawing tool, a font editor. There's this thing called Orca, which is a live live coding uh, IDE. It's, it's meant for live coding music. It uses this crazy system, which is like based on brain fuck, where every, like, 
it's super complicated. I tried to understand it once. It's for like live coding music stuff. Uh, it seems like the sort of thing that if you could figure it out, it would be ridiculously powerful, but it honestly just broke my brain. Um, and I'm going to come back to it one day, probably. There are a bunch of different musical, like really basic, like uh, digital music stuff you can do with it. There's like hex editors, clocks, there's a spreadsheet application, and then there's some games. Uh, the best game is a game called Cat Cubes, which Dotesmite is hopelessly addicted to. Um, uh, but there's also like imp like just clones of like Snake, Pong, Flappy Bird, uh, Minesweeper, Tic Tac Toe. Um, some people have even started doing networking stuff on it, but it seems to be really early stages. Um, and then there's some there's some operating systems that have even made for the Vervara virtual computer. To, which is the for example there's a there's a basic fourth machine uh, called UF and there's also UXN fourth which are both different fourth machine uh, computer operating systems that run on the UX on UXN there's also Collapse OS which is also I guess actually also a fourth there's a lot of fourth stuff because because UXN is also a stack based uh, or Atal is also stack based like fourth. Um, there was, there's just a whole bunch of shit is what I'm saying and this and it's only sort of just gotten started um, but my my idea sorry that was supposed to be a brief introduction to what it was and uh, if you want to know you might be sitting to yourself like why the fuck would anyone want to do this um, well there are various reasons I, again I'm going to make my own video about this one day that I hope will cover everything more in depth but if you want to read about it now uh, just go on xxiivv, um, what is it, xxiivv.com, um, slash site, slash uxn.html, and you'll, you can read about it there, I suppose, um, but, but, but nonetheless, uxn seems really cool to me, um, it seems very, very simple, and, and very cool, and I like it, and the point was, back to where, so that's why I have this fucking thing open. It's a tutorial uh, to learn how to write UX tar. Now, here's a fact about me. I don't know shit about computer. I don't know shit about programming. The, you know, I, I know the basics of like Linux and basic HTML, CSS. And I can, you know, I, like I know how Linux file systems work and like enough to install various Linux OSs and whatever. But uh, when it comes to like, Programming, I know nothing. You know, HTML and CSS aren't really programming languages, and outside of that, I know nothing. Uh, I did like uh, two months of Python in school, and uh, which we really did not get very far um, beyond uh, Hello World, uh, and I don't remember any of it, even if we did. I think the teacher just gave up at some point. So when it comes to programming, I really don't know anything. The only other experience I have with programming really is uh, maybe, uh, like this game called TIS 100, which is an assembly language programming game that no one asked for. And it's amazing. And I highly recommend playing, uh, TIS 100. It's a great puzzle game, especially if you're interested in assembly language programming. Uh, but even that I was really bad at, and I think I, uh, could never get past the fourth level, uh, cause that game is really fucking hard. It's a Zaktronics game. If you know anything about Zaktronics, then, uh, it's their second hardest game. <laughs> behind Shenzhen I.O. normally considered. Um, but anyway, TIS 100 gave me an interest in assembly language programming and I thought what better way to learn an assembly language than UXN because it's something that I'm interested in. And so I've been going through this tutorial on how the fuck UXN work. I've only just started, I'm only on uh, day three right now, um, but I've been trying to figure it out. It's very complicated. It's extremely complicated, and I don't understand any of it, and it's all very hard, and hard to understand, and I'm, I'm kind of stupid. Uh, I feel like jumping right in, in this, with assembly is kind of a, a weird way to start learning programming. I think the, the, like, the, the other thing, right, is that this, this whole thing is not written for someone with zero program experience. It's normally, I, it's written for people who have some experience in higher level programming languages, but not much experience in assembly or low level languages. Um, whereas I have zero experience in any languages really, 
and so this th there's a lot of stuff here that it, it's just hard to wrap my head around um uh but uh the thing is a lot of the stuff that i will learn about uxn as i understand it is going to be transferable to a lot of different situations uh you know the, the basic thing that changes is just syntax and like the names for different operations and opcodes and whatever but the fundamental features of an assembly language are the same from whether you're learning 6502 assembly, x86 assembly, or UXN, you know, they're fundamentally the same sort of thing. Plus, uh, TAL is also very similar to fourth in a lot of ways, and um, which should mean it's going to be a little easier to learn fourth, um, I've, you know, which is a language I'm very interested in learning. Plus, on top of all of that, uh, a lot of people who, who program... Damn, you just got crazy RNG. I yeah, as you can see, Dotsmite is playing Cat Cubes right now. The best uh, UXN game. Honestly, it's worth it, uh, installing a UXN emulator just to play Cat Cubes. Um, I'm using a GBA. I know you're using a GV, I saw. Uh, Cat Cubes also available for Game Boy Advanced if, you're, if you, you, you have that. I don't know, but anyway. Um, what I'm getting at here is I'm hoping that even though this is not necessarily that useful, it doesn't, firstly, it doesn't have to be useful, um, it can just be fun, uh, but secondly, it may end up being useful nonetheless because it's going to lead to an increased understanding of how computers work and that's never going to be not useful. A lot of people who program like higher level languages like C or whatever say that they get a lot out of learning assembly because it teaches them what the compiler is actually going to turn their code into. Um, so there you go. I'm learning UXN tile. That's that's the fundamental situation here. Um, not just UXN, but I'm learning about the UXN system as a whole. Um, and, I'm, and I just want to emphasize this. I'm very stupid, and this stuff is extremely hard for me. It is very much not how my brain thinks. Um, uh, assembly language programming is very counterintuitive to me. All programming is very counterintuitive to me. It's a whole new way of thinking that I have zero practice with, and I'm going very slowly, and I'm really hoping I can stay dedicated to it. Um, and uh, I do have some long-term goals, but right now I'm not thinking about those. I'm just focusing on just uh, sticking to these things and trying to get some basic understanding of how this stuff works. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty pog, I think. Parasocial relationships are neither particularly bad nor particularly modern. There are accounts of behaviours I consider to resemble parasociality going back to kabuki actor fans in ancient Japan, to gladiators, historical or relig religious figures, and even more recently pop stars and actors. The argument that is often made is that the scale of the condition is much larger now given the real-time, intimate nature of particularly live streaming. Kabuki players, gladiatorial battles, concerts, etc. all happen in real time too. However, I will concede that it's likely the difference in the specificity of real-time feedback and interaction plays a role. This in itself, though, is not a problem. The only times parasociality actually becomes problematic are a. if the fan invades the entertainer's privacy, or b. if the entertainer exploits the one-sided relationship for money and material gain. There is also a lesser-known option c, which I will get around to later on. Note that the nature of these problems is not that parasociality itself is the negative aspect, both of these scenarios are undesirable regardless of whether they are tied to a parasocial relationship. The issue taken here is that parasociality leads to, an inc to, to increased occurrences of these problems. A main concern I have with this discussion is that we very often hear about scenario A, a crazed stalker fan, but rarely hear about scenario B. When a creator is harmed by their fans, they have a platform to voice their concerns which will be heard by a large group of people. On the other hand, if an individual fan is exploited by an entertainer, they often have no platform to voice their issues in the first place, are too ashamed to talk openly about them, or are victim blamed. Imagine for a minute the kind of person who would donate thousands of their hard-earned money to a streamer in the hopes of forming a relationship or authentic connection. You probably imagined a sad, lonely man, probably living still with his parents, likely autistic or otherwise neurodivergent, with below average physical attractiveness and poor hygiene. When I imagine these kinds of people, I can't help but feel both frustration and sympathy. Why are you doing this? Why are you wasting your money on something so fruitless? Might be my gut reaction. 
but I have to bear in mind, to these people it isn't fruitless, it's the only hope they can see of escaping loneliness. My frustration then becomes directed at the entertainers, who stand to benefit voluntarily from maintaining these relationships, and so, while they may not openly encourage it, definitely do not discourage it either. However, it's also not accurate to see this kind of problem to see this as a problem of individual bad actors. They're doing what the systems which have been set up to encourage them to do max, to maximize profit. Some people blame greedy female booba streamers baiting this kind of response for money, but this is of course just thinly veiled sexism, since attractive con conventionally male streamers like Hassan do not receive this level of criticism. However, blaming this on creepily, creepy autistic men is equally problematic, likely counts to ableism, and ultimately unhelpful. At its core, this is a structural problem with the system set up to monetize live streaming. The streamer is incentivized to attract as many donations as possible, and they, they in turn, as their job, incentivize their fans to donate as much as possible. The solution to this would be if streaming platforms, attract, uh, if streaming platforms paid creators a flat salary for streaming, like any other job does. Since then, they can clearly, since they can clearly afford it, they already do it for big streamers they want to keep from jumping ship onto other platforms to the tune of millions of dollars, and it would be less exploitative. This would introduce its own host of issues, however, like censoring criticism of the platform, unfair wages and working hours, the stuff every other wage labourer has to deal with. It's clear, then, that the only solution to parasocial relationships is a communist revolution. So, what was the hidden option C I mentioned earlier? Scenario C, an entertainer who views their own fans parasocially and thinks that they are their friends. This, again, is not unique to streaming. Entertainers have had this uh, for years have talked about the addictive high of going on stage to adoring fans and so on. It's tough to figure this one out since those affected by it normally don't see it as a problem and so don't speak out about it. This sort of scenario is an inherent issue with fame itself and even communism can't fix this one. This is now my third time trying to record this. Uh, I posted this blog post um, on my blog nothankyou.neocities.org um, the, the O's are zeros in no thank you as they always are. Um, and I, I thought I would just read it out to you and then talk a little bit about it. So, uh, on Sisyphus. One must imagine Sisyphus happy, endlessly pushing his boulder without the possibility of ever reaching the goal. For sure, it is by nature impossible for the boulder to reach the summit, to imagine Sisyphus succeeding in his trial as a fiction. When I was younger, I saw this absurdist story as encouraging, but now when I look back at Sisyphus, I see a happy but pitiable man. For as absurd as it is to imagine him happy... My ultimate goal is to further imagine a, a more absurd fiction, that Sisyphus might one day succeed. The transgression of subverting the absurdist narrative, not by negating it with pure reason, but by extending it further with a more fantastical fiction, this, I see, is an amicable goal. What CCRU misses in its theory of hyperstition is the crucial transitory step by which a fiction realizes itself. Irony is, a, irony is the pump of the flow of immunitization. The fictionalized 80s nostalgia flows into vaporwave with a critical detached irony, which is then washed away in the torrent of flows towards Stranger Things. In language, use of memetic language, take the word pog, it's well documented that these terms begin as fictions, are then used ironically, and then the irony is washed away as it enters a person idiolect. And so I don't joke to you, we must imagine Sisyphus atop the hill, boulder and all, emotionless. So I wrote this as a joke, basically. Because I was thinking about um, how I started saying pog in my day-to-day -day language. I was thinking about the, the well-documented process by which people start saying a word from the internet as a joke. And then before they even realize it, they've started saying it unironically. Uh, and I thought that was kind of a funny thing to write about. And I thought I could make it funny by linking it to hyperstition and then I realized I'd actually kind of hit the nail on the head because I could apply it to these sorts of hauntological nostalgias like like a stranger things or um you know the the more recently ironically using rage faces to unironic troll face memes that are coming back and I think what I didn't mention in this blog post because it was kind of outside the scope is that this is obviously an example of a, a time spiral complexity that like you know, the, the the time is both cyclic and linear, and therefore it spirals, uh, I suppose, towards zero time. Um, been a while since I read... The, anyway, uh, I, I, that's probably relevant. Um, and uh, so then I, I was also thinking about the myth of Sisyphus thing, the Camus thing, the absurdist thing, and I was, I've always been, you know, 
it's a, it's a, it's not bad. I don't want us to seem like a critique of that absurdism. You know, I I think as much of, as some people might refute absurdism as sort of baby's first philosophy, I think there's a lot of merit in it. Um, I often find myself thinking back to that sort of metaphor. I think it's very useful for a lot of people. I think it hits on something that's um, tangibly real. For, uh, but uh, I have always been a little disappointed that the depths of the absurd scenario that someone could manage is just that someone might enjoy hardship. Um, you know, to anyone who who knows anything about um, uh, psychoanalysis or anything like this, or Nietzsche, you know, from Nietzsche to Jung to Freud to Deleuze to uh, um, Bataille, you know, to all of them, that they all talk about the the, the the variations on some sort of uh, tendency towards zero, like a, a death drive, the self-destructive, these these types of things that people have this, um, you know, innate drive towards destruction. I mean, even uh, even like uh, fucking um, spinal catastrophism sort of expands on this. Uh, and I think in a really good way. And so I, I've always thought that the idea that someone could be happy while suffering isn't really so absurd at, at all as it might seem, um, and that there might be more uh, amusing, absurd scenarios that Sisyphus could have done. Uh, so I was thinking about this, and I was like, what, you know, my first instinct was he should just, even even though it's impossible for him to to reach the top of the hill like by nature it's impossible I'm not when I say that he should do it anyway what I mean I don't mean to negate the impossibility of the task by saying that it's still impossible he just does it and I find that funny the, the contradiction the between the fact that he, he does it but it's impossible um, in the same way that um, something is fiction, fictionalized and, and makes itself real it's, if something is fiction it's impossible to exist, but nonetheless, it uh, creates itself. In the same in the same vein, um, you know, Sisyphus reaching the top of the hill of this endless treadmill, you know, it, it, it's a, it's like a joke. If I were to tell a joke about uh, a guy who uh, goes to the gym and Usain Bolt goes to the gym and he runs so fast he reaches the end of the treadmill. I, I just made that up, but that like I could imagine that being a joke, like a funny imagery like that. Um, that's the sort of absurd uh, thinking that I find to be more compelling, personally. Um, and the fact that he's emotionless, I think, is the only possible solution, because, you know, he, he he's no longer happy. He's no longer happy to be uh, struggling to reach the heights you know, he's 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 done it, but he's 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 neither sad nor happy nor anything. He's actually lost something of himself, um, and so he's empty. He's emotionless. Um, and the other options for Sisyphus to do are number one, he could uh, destroy the boulder. Number two, he could turn around and walk away. Um, you know, there's a there's a billion different things. I would I would rather that when he reaches the top of the hill, he actually sits on top of his boulder. I think that would be um, the most powerful thing that Sisyphus could do. I say when, um, you know, again, it's impossible for this to happen, um, but that's all the more reason why it, why why it's funny. Uh, um, I I suppose that's basically what I wanted to get at. Uh, is this this sort of or, or, when I say funny, I suppose ironic is is the word I should be using. You know that it's a. Uh, it's not necessarily ironic, but it's 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 absurd. It's funny. It's ironic. It's all of these things, but also it's it's kind of mostly just absurd. But in the same way that using a word like pog, or um, schizo troll face memes, are you know equally absurd. And I thought writing a somewhat you know word salady blog post where I talk you know, ostensibly in earnest about the word pog uh, is kind of funny. It's kind of uh, absurd in itself. So I thought 
um, you know, as as much as it, uh, if essentially the point I want to get at here is that if you read this and think it sounds pretentious, that's the joke. Uh, so I don't, yeah, again, I don't, I don't want to be uh, critiquing too hard the the whole myth of Sisyphus ideal here, because again, I think it it has a, a lot of merit. Um, I I just mean to uh, put into the imagination of people uh, this this further absurdity. I saw a tweet the other day. Yes, I am working on my Twitter addiction. I'm cutting down my usage. It's happening. This is just it. I just been. There's a tweet I saw a while ago that uh, has stuck in my mind because I think it hit on something very poignant. It was something along the lines of. The anime fandom, I remember they called it the anime fandom, which I thought was interesting. But the anime fandom is the only fandom where a large chunk of the people involved are either indifferent or actively hate the medium they're supposed to be fans of. And I thought this is so true and so accurate. Um, you know, like, there are so many different... I mean, I suppose it's only to be expected because anime is not a genre, it's a medium. Right, and so being a fan of anime doesn't really mean anything to most people because you know people who are fans of anime in that they really like you know watching Dragon Ball and Naruto when they were kids is you know not even really comparable to uh, I don't know someone who's hardcore into Yuri manga or something I don't know but uh, like there's there's a it, it, it's such a broad sphere. Uh, with such variety that it's it's hard to really quantify, you know, the anime fandom as one thing. But nonetheless, I still think that, um, you know, I suppose maybe this is a linguistic problem, the difference between, like, anime fan versus otaku, right? Like, almost everyone these days is an anime fan, but not that many people would actively call themselves otaku. I say not, I mean, there's still thousands and thousands, but, uh, you know, like, Every, you've got giant brands collaborating with Ghibli and uh, Katsuhiro Otoma and, and, and stuff like this, and the massive popularity of Shonen continues to be a thing. Um, you know, Reddit always has one seasonal anime that they cling on to, you know, Kaguya-sama, Spy X Family. The, 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 they always have something, right? Um, uh, so, you know, those people I wouldn't necessarily class as otaku, although they might be anime fans. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's there's some merit to this statement, right? There, there's all of these sort of boring factions um, who, who ultimately kind of hate or are at the most indifferent towards anime. Like, you know, you have these sorts of... Um, uh, what I guess people refer to as anime elitists. The sort of people who... I think anime peaked in the 80s OVA era with all of this high class um, sci fi action mecha um, and incredibly detailed animation, um, massive budgets, uh, experimental themes, and, and, and such like. You know, these, these sorts of people. We, we all know one. Um, I really do look like Forsen. Anyway, um, uh, you know, these sorts of people, and they, 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 these are the sorts of people who are likely to complain that uh, anime has been overrun by isekai these days or whatever, right? That's that's the, one of the first things. Um, but there's also, you know, the large portion of uh, anime quote-unquote fans who uh, are dislike uh, the, a vast majority of the medium for inane political reasons, whether they be right-wingers who think wokeness is infecting the medium, or left-wingers who, uh, you know, think that anime's all for Nazis and conservative, you know, these, these inane, insufferable people, um, uh, that really just hate, hate, hate all of this stuff, you know, like, I, I know, I've, I've just never seen a good argument against the idea that if you don't like something, then just don't watch it, you know? Uh, there, there, there's an argument to be made here that this this whole idea um, that this 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 like rim lighting is fucking sick, right? Like, doesn't this doesn't isn't this like like cinematic as fuck? Like this rim lighting, anyway. Um, that you know, 
uh, the Americans um, see media consumption as like this this high political act because it's really all they have left. Uh, every, every other political act has been, been taken from them. Most people, you know, they, 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 they have to see media consumption as this political act because, or like something that carries political weight, the media you enjoy to consume because they, they don't have any, anything real to do. They don't, they don't, it's, it's all been control society away from them. All they have left is media consumption. And so, because this is one of the few areas where they feel like they have choice, and meaningful choice, given how media can be so effective on an individual or a culture, they attach political weight to it that just doesn't exist um, in, the re in, in reality. I think that's a good, a good argument about why this happens. Because um, you, you don't see it happening too much in Japan. Of course, it happens in Japan, but not to the extent, and, and not to the specifically partisan politics extent that it does in, in the West. I think that's interesting. But these people hate anime, right? Like the people who complain about incest or lolly or, you know, any number of these problematic sexism, whatever. Um, they don't understand the medium. They don't understand it. They don't. They don't. They're not ingrained in the culture. Then they're, they're um. They're they're essentially. Uh, I mean, not not to get too radical here, but the argument of like uh, you know we need to go over to this other culture and civilize them um, is is not the best look for Americans, especially a country that you literally nuked. I don't consider it to be the best look, but uh, hey, I also think that the 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 other side of the coin, the oh, all of these Western leftists are uh, annoying the Japanese creators or whatever. It happens, right? Like it does happen. There's there's animators and artists who get driven off of, uh, you know, uh, the Western internet because because Westerners can't stop complaining about their art. Um, because they see it, they're, they're idiots. Um, but, you know, there's there's no reason to believe that leftism doesn't also exist in Japan, right? Like, most anime are not actually Nazi propaganda, as much as some people would like you to think they are. On Even some Nazis think they are. There's very few anime that are actually hard right-wing propaganda. They exist, right? Like, the irregular Magic High... Or, um, I don't know, there's a few, but they're pretty rare. Um, I just think, you know, beyond all of this, honestly, this was a bad way to start the video, because I've, I've gone on a rant about politics, when really this has nothing to do with politics. What it's really about is, um, you know, the way I see my relationship to, to not just anime, I'm using anime to generalize, you know, manga, visual novels, etc., is sort of, you know, it's, I, I'm always bearing in mind that this is a cult medium, right? You know, the, the popular shonens and, and stuff, these aren't really part of the cult media. These are the sort of breakout successes. But the stuff I like, you know, the, the slice of life stuff and Iyashike stuff and uh, to some extent light novel stuff, uh, like early light novel adaptation stuff, or just light novel adaptation, blah, 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 I'm getting too bogged down with details, but the stuff I like about anime, the stuff that most people, the stuff that makes up the majority of the, of the medium is cult media, right? In the same way, and I, I view my relationship to it as I think most people in the past who have enjoyed cult media view their own relationship to it. Take, for example, um, Jay from Red Letter Media, right? He is big into these kind of like low-budget B-movie shitty Italian horror films, right? Um, I've tried to watch some of these, right? The Giallo films, Giallo, Dario Argento films. They're not, they're not for me, right? They're not for me. The, 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 the dubbing is too distracting. The, the visual effects are too distracting. The, the pacing and structure of the plots are all over the place. But I understand why he likes them, right? They, they have this unique charm to them. They're not good in the traditional sense, especially, I think he would admit to you, you know, like a lot of these movies, some of them sort of transcend the genre and become their own thing. 
but you know a good chunk of them are very mediocre um, or just bad by traditional definitions um, for a number of reasons um, but nonetheless they have their own appeal that and sometimes the things that might be the appeal in the eyes of those movies is stuff that makes them unappealing in the eyes of a, a sort of more pulled out perspective and I, this is how I view my relationship to anime too, right? Like, take um, the anime I just watched, um, Problem Children from Another World uh, doing something, I forgot what it's called, but it's, a, it's a, a light novel adaptation about a super overpowered guy and some cute girls who get transported to this completely insane other world. It's, it's an isekai technically, but it's not a fantasy isekai. I suppose it's somewhat of a fantasy isekai, but it's not you know, your generic fantasy isekai, it's uh, closer to maybe something along, some light novel in line with like Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere, Railgun, these sort of dense, um, like, uh, where, where the world is very different from the world that we live in, right? These, these sorts of very, very dense, very heady, conceptual, um, but also like weird and fucking out there and kind of nonsensical um, uh, worlds, right? It's, it's kind of in there. And um, by, by, by all definitions, it's probably a bad show, right? Like it's, it's uh, the characters are like inane and uninteresting. They, they, they have no chemistry, even though they claim to be like best friends. You know, everyone loves the main guy, despite the fact that he's an obnoxious asshole. Um, he's also way too overpowered for no reason. Um, and it makes, there's no tension in the show, um, there's, you know, the, the, the plot barely makes any fucking sense, uh, the, the world building has a, a, you know, a ton of holes that are never really explained or that don't make any sense, um, you know, a lot of the main characters are kind of one note, um, especially the bad guys are all, like, just bad guys because they're bad guys and they, they just want, you know, the, the money and power and they, they don't really have any sort of characterization or anything deeper about them. There's a billion flaws to point out. I could keep going. The show's cheap. <laughs> I could, it, like, it, looks, it looks cheaply produced. Uh, the, the voice acting isn't that great. The animation isn't that great. The color choice isn't that great. The character designs are kind of over, you know, overbearing, over detailed characters that don't really look that good in motion, even though they probably look better in the pictures and the light novels. There's, I could, I could keep going for ages. There's so many problems with the show. However, I watched it all. I enjoyed my time with it. Why? Because all of these problems from a pulled back perspective turn into merits when you take the show on its own level, when you go into it expecting a piece of pulpy cult media that uh, comes from a, you know, a place with different aims than traditional media, right? It, it's not trying to do the same sorts of thing. Like, those character designs that are very over-designed and, you know, that don't make any logical sense, if you approach it from the idea of they're not trying to make logical sense, they're trying to just have a bunch of cool shit happen. They're trying to look unique and uh, fit the aesthetic of the medium of, of what it's trying to do, right? Like, it's hard to really put into words, but it's playing off of a bunch of cultural memes, you know? Like, like it's schoolgirl outfits, bunny girl ears, whatever, right? Like, those aren't really in that... I mean, there's not really schoolgirl outfits, but, the, like, the aesthetics of otaku media, it's, it's playing on those tropes and bringing its own flair to them Rather than trying to play with the tropes of real life, it's trying to play with the tropes of, of this particular medium. The nonsensical isekai plot isn't... If you're trying to read into it as if it's it's supposed to make literal sense and be as, as much of a built-out world as our own, you kind of have to let that go and, and, you know, see the show on its own level where it's just trying to make a world exist that can bring you interesting, cool concepts... Uh, that don't necessarily have to make sense. Uh, they don't have to, you know, all come together into this one, you know, uh, very comprehensible world that, that is similar to our own. They're trying to be, you know, it's still not a great show. I'm not going to go out here and say everyone should watch it. It's, it's, it's pretty bad, but it, uh, it's, it's less bad than you would think if you didn't give it if you didn't approach it from the right direction, 
And I think a lot of these people just don't approach approach anime from the right direction. Like the people who complain about isekai, right? Like what's the problem with isekai? Is it that we've seen the same plot over and over again? I don't see these same people complaining about mecha or um, fantasy or sci-fi or um, slice of life. Sometimes they do, but different people. Um, you know, I, I or shonen. Like these all also have the same plot, right? Every story has the same plot. It's called the hero's journey. Um, it's just a, a genre. It's it's less of a plot and more of a genre at that point. You know, would you would you would you whatever? But like, there's nothing inherently wrong with the genre. Even these people probably have a few isekai that they like, like you know, uh, uh, Sonoku. Konosuba, <laughs> Sona Cooper, it's stuff like this, right? Um, uh, what they, the thing is, they, they're like, I don't like all the fan service. I don't like all of the overpowered protagonists. I don't like all of the, the kind of mid humor. I don't like all of the, uh, you know, trappings of the genre. And it just sounds to me like I don't like all the focus on the cute girls. I don't like all the, um, you know, the blah 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 blah. It just sounds to me like you don't like anime. Just watch something else. If you want a you you want a, a, a detailed long form plot with with where the world everyone acts realistically and just watch a movie, watch a TV show, read a book. I come to anime because it has stuff that nothing else can give you, right? Like the, the if you if you're gonna come in here and then complain that it's not like the other things you like, then it sounds to me like you shouldn't be watching anime. It sounds like you should be doing the things you enjoy doing instead. It's very strange, these people. Like, the stuff I like about anime is the stuff that is uniquely anime, even if that stuff is bad. If it's bad, like, there's no other medium where I can, where I can say it's another generic uh, bunny girl hybrid. Like, no other medium has human-animal hybrids be a fucking trope. Right? That's what I like. It's this weird shit, right? Like, oh, it's a, it's a... It's, 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 you know, it's bad in a way that is, can only be bad in this particular situation. And that's what I like. That's what I like. One of the reasons Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere is so confusing for people who just watch the anime is, um, that, uh, well, in most anime that have, or like light novel adaptations and manga adaptations that have complex weird power systems and weird complex fights with those weird complex powers um, you have a situation like this main main something happens that involves magic attacks or whatever and then the the, the villain goes huh so you expected me to do that and the main character says yeah when I saw you do this, I knew you were going to use your attack before I did this in order to do that, right? And it, uh, but that trick wouldn't work on me because you're too slow. And then they do another attack and then they stand back and then you have the guy on the sidelines who goes, what? His power just increased by 5%. That's too much. How is he going to... You know, you have this whole thing, right? In in Horizon, uh, in, in the, the light novels... Um, the, all of this is explained by the fact that you can just hear the characters' internal monologues when they're fighting, right? Like, you can, you can hear them reasoning out why they're doing what they're doing. Like, this guy has this attack, but he's not supposed to use it on, uh, he's only allowed to use this attack on people who aren't Christian. This is one of the, genuinely, this is one of the characters in Horizon. He's a mecha. He's a Christian mecha. And he can own, so he has to use the attack on the Shinto person, right? Uh, and so then, when the Christian character jumps in front of her, he can't use that attack on her. And so then, uh, you know, that was their plan all along. So in the in the light novel, you hear that happen. In the first episode where that happens in the the anime, you don't hear that, any of that. It just happens, and you're kind of left. There's some throwaway dialogue about it, but they don't really mention it. Like, they don't, you, you don't hear the reasoning in the same way you hear the reasoning in the light novels, and that's what makes it, the show, so confusing to a lot of people. Honestly speaking, as a supplemental material, I mean, even, first of all, it's, it's the Dark Souls of anime, as in, you know, the theory goes that in Dark Souls, everything is technically fair, a super observant player could figure everything out, 
uh, but no one will because they're not that smart. The same is the case in Horizon. Everything is technically there. A theoretical perfect viewer could figure everything out, but um, no one's going to. Okay, so this is my sort of go-to breakfast uh, while I'm here. Um, I already buttered the bread before I decided to record, but this is like seeded rye bread, black bread. Um, here, this is the brand it is, if you're interested. Um, Sam, yeah, whatever the fuck, I don't know how to pronounce that, but yeah. Um, so we get some of that. This is a very Estonian meal. Um, then we got some Estonian mustard. If you don't know, oops, Estonian mustard, very strong. Uh, some of the strongest mustard possible. I love strong mustard, so that is very good. I am going to bring some tubes of that back to London with me. Uh, add the mustard to the bread. We just spread it. We don't, since it's very strong, you only need to put it on one side. Yeah, I butter both sides of my bread. You could say I'm pretty, pretty rich. Uh, next step is Estonian cheese. Estonian cheese is this weird fucking thing. Um, it's uh, invented by the Soviets. It's like chemically fermented or something. I don't really know how it works. Uh, it does not taste like natural cheese. It kind of has a unique flavor. It's also not that strong, so you can use quite a lot of it. But uh, it is both very cheap and quite nice. It also melts very well. Although I'm not going to be melting my sandwich. So some Estonian cheese. And finally some sliced beef. Uh, about three slices of cured beef. It's quite, quite an indulgent amount. Uh, and there you go, then you close the sandwich up. This is the part that isn't Estonian, see? People here would eat it as an open-faced sandwich. But, uh, um, I, I like to hold things in two hands. And without things fucking falling everywhere. So, you know, I guess I still have not gone, gone native yet. But there you go. Now, in my opinion, what this really needs is a bit of lettuce and maybe some pickled onions. Don't have any of those things. I keep forgetting to make pickled onions, so uh, this will have to do. But the mustard adds the sort of vinegary acid that it needs anyway. Hmm. And it's a good sandwich. And on top of all of that, the rye bread, like the super dark seeded rye bread, I can I can at least pretend that's healthy, right? Has all the uh, what loads of fiber, probably linoleic acid. That's supposed to be good for you, right? These interest stacks are um, a pretty good thing that Mal has decided to add. Um, this is the definitive list of cute girls doing cute things shows from 2002 to 2011. Um, and I suppose I will go through and tell you why I haven't watched all the ones that I haven't watched. Some of them, because look, I'm supposed to be the guy that's watched almost every cute girls doing cute things show, right? But I've only seen 36 out of these 50 shows. So I will now explain. Some of them, like Bin Chotan, I just haven't gotten around to yet. I'm going to watch them one day. But some of them, like uh, this, for example, Muteki Kamba Musume, I dropped. Um, there's also the big example uh, of uh, all of the Minami K sequels. Uh, I don't really like Minami K, so I haven't watched uh, all of the three sequels. The same can be said about Saki. I didn't really like Saki, so I didn't watch all of the sequels. Um, I have not finished GA Gejutsu Art Design Class. 
Um, some of these I just don't know about. Like Yoku Wakaru Gendai Maho. I have never heard of this. Um, uh, but it looks pretty pretty cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely add this to my plan to watch, cause um, you know, cute girls doing cute things show from two thousand nine. Can't be bad. I had also never heard of this Code E show. I don't know if that's on the list, but I just found this as well. Um, Mosaki da 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 kind of memo not that good. Solo no Oto. I'm just not interested in Solo no Oto. I know everyone likes it. I it just is not interesting to me. Uh, Chubra uh, is, I don't think very, it, it, it's not supposed to be very good, but um, I, I was pretty sure that I had this on my list. I'm surprised that it was not on my list, so maybe I get around to watching that pretty soon. In fact, I might watch that today. Um, we got Shinryaki, wait, is this a season two of Shinryaki Musume? You can, wait, I didn't know this existed. I didn't know there was a season two of Squid Girl. What the fuck? Why did no one tell me this? <laughs> why, why did no one tell me this that Squid Girl had a second season? What the fuck? Is it is it any good? I mean, it has a 7.48. What the hell? How did I not know this? How did I not know that Squid Girl has a season two? I'm, I feel ashamed in myself right now. How did I not, how did I not know that? Anyway, uh, Milky Homes, I didn't really like, so of course I did not watch the sequel, or the sequel to that, or the sequel to that. Uh, Nichijo, A Channel, I didn't really like. Soft Tenny is on my list already, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. Idol Master, even though it says plan to watch, I actually watched the first episode and uh, decided to come back to it at a future time. Ikoku Meido, I don't know this one. Ikoku Meiro no Kurose, the animation. I have not heard of this before. 19th century Paris. This is this looks fucking sick. How have I never seen this before? Who made this? Satellite? What the fuck is this studio? Satellite? Oh, Satellite. Did I just say Sat... Bruh. Oh, they made White Album 2, Log Horizon. Huh. I have literally never heard of this show before. Uh, this guy's seen it. This guy, the guy with the, the the dude profile picture. Anyone who uses my anime list has seen this guy's reviews at some point. He's only seen a thousand three hundred anime. There, were, I know, I know people who have seen more than that. What is his top ten? Mushishi Tentai. I mean, he has pretty. Good taste. Oh, the Ima Soko, now and then here and there, is not very good taste. And anyway, sorry, I got distracted there. This is, this is interesting. Um, I'll add this to my list. I, I have not heard of this one before. Um, obviously I've seen all of Yuri Yuri. Mori to Sun when, uh, Mukuchi had dropped. So I'm not going to watch season two. And that's why I haven't seen all the ones I haven't seen. So out of the ones that I actually haven't seen and want to see, you've got Binchotan, uh, Aria the Origination, um, uh, Yoku Wakaru Gendai Maho, um, Chubra, Ikemosume Season 2. I might come back to Milky Homes at some point, but I'm not sure. Uh, Soft Tenny uh, and Ikoku Meiro no blah, 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 blah. So basically only six shows that I actually want to see. Even though it says I've only seen 36 out of 50, there's actually only six shows on this list that I want to see. And this is only up to 2011. Um, there's, there should be way more I mean, there's, this is funny girls doing funny things, which are not necessarily cute. This is an interesting idea. What is this list? Like, Hyako is just not very good. I don't know why you would say that's funny. It's, it's incredibly unfunny, actually. Um, but yeah, all of this stuff is, is my speed. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of anime to watch. There's plenty of anime that I that I w would like to watch. Hey, 
Denkin Sankyu Magikaru Bokyan. You should uh, watch that one. That's a good show, even though it has a it has a low rating because people on my anime list don't know fucking good anime when they see it. Okay, that's one of the most underrated shows of all time. Anyone who knows anything about cute girls will tell you. Denkin Sankyu Magikaru Pokan. One of the best shows ever. It's one of the best goddamn shows, okay? And you should watch it because it's very good. It's funny. It has g- cute girls of various otaku archetypes, okay? And it's just good. It looks good as well. It has a good art style. And it birthed the video game Wolf Girl With You. Um, yeah, so there's, there's shows that I haven't seen. I'm not... Listen, I've just seen almost all of the shows. I haven't seen actually all of the shows. Oh, yeah, Plastic Nissan is really fucking funny. That's And obviously Take You is extremely funny. Uh, yes, these are animes with girls who are generally funny. Is this a... What the fuck is this? Mermaid Girls? See, you, there's just... There's just shows here that, like... That just exist, and and people have seen, and I'm not one of them. This looks interesting. When is this? 2013? Who directed this? Let's find out what he's done. Chainsaw Man? Directed by the guy who did Chainsaw Man? So, um, I'm looking at I'm looking at lists of uh, cute girls stuff on on Mal. Yeah. I found this show called Nami. Let's just call it Muromi San. I found one called Muromi San. I looked down at the director. It looks like he did basically everything on this show. He basically made it himself. Director, episode director, storyboard, key animation, and animation director. And I go on his page. And he's the direct. He's the, he's one of the directors on the new Chainsaw Man anime. I see. Um, but what else has he? He's done a lot of key animation. Um, I mean, he seems like a pretty experienced guy in terms of animation, but. He doesn't seem to have directed. That much stuff before. Maybe this was like his big directorial thing, and it didn't really do that well, and so he's just been doing. I mean, he's he's clearly a. Re- I I would say this guy's probably a respected guy, even if he's not. He since he's done so much key animation on so many good shows, um. But he's not really a director. Nonetheless, that's that often leads to some interesting stuff. Maybe this was just like his passion project or something. What's his name? Yoshihara Tatsuya-san. Yeah, I put San on names when I'm speaking Japanese. I'm basically Japanese. Um, Jashin Chan Dropkick I'm watching right now. I really like the character designs in this show. It's a shame that it's not very funny. But anyway, yeah. Jashin Chan Dropkick. It, 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 it has a really good... I really like the way the show looks... I, I I wish the show was better than it is. I really I'm really trying to force myself to enjoy to enjoy it. <laughs> Cause I really like the way it looks. Uh, I can probably manage to force myself to enjoy it. But today's plans involve okay, if I go to my mail I have been trying uh, yeah. I had 18 shows that I was supposedly currently watching. Um, I went through and dropped some of them, which is why it's now 16 shows, because I realized I'm probably never going to finish those. Um, actually, hold on. I just dropped this. I thought I just dropped this. This should be dropped. Yeah, Isekai Make You the Haramore. Not a good anime. So we have 15 shows that I'm currently watching. Obviously, I am not actually watching 15 shows. Um, These are just shows that I've started watching and have 
not finished, uh, even though I have not necessarily dropped them. Uh, Isekai Yakyo is the only current Eon show on this list. It is also uh, pretty damn good. Um, so I'm going through them one by one and trying to finish them all because I keep picking up new anime without finishing old anime. Uh, so I'm going to finish Ninin Nin. To, I, I say this, but my plan right now is... I mean, some of these I'm not finishing on purpose, right? Uh, yeah, uh, Mug Cup Season 2, I'm planning to finish on the aeroplane back to the UK. Um, and... Uh, um, same with Tamayura, I'm saving, because I have, those two shows I have downloaded, so I'm saving both of those for times when I don't have internet. Um, I also have, uh, Prisma Ilya, Two Way Hers downloaded, um, so all, and How Can I Receive, I have all, all of these shows I have downloaded, um, so for some reason I'm like, st I don't know why I'm weirdly skeptical of watching them, also, Prisma Ilya, Two Way Hurts sucks. I just decided for some reason to make it my mission to watch every piece of Prisma Ilya media, even though I have not really enjoyed any of it. <laughs> I, I like the slice of life stuff and hate everything else about it, and uh, most of it is everything else about it. Uh, but yeah, and today I'm, I've, been, I've been watching Nining Gashinobuden for probably three years now. I watched eight episodes in a row and then just sort of never came back to it, even though it's good. I remember thinking that it was, it's, it's a, if you don't know what it is, it's an early UFO table show uh, from back when they did mainly like surrealist comedies. And it is maybe their funniest show. I mean, uh, Manabi Strait isn't necessarily funny. Well, like all the time, although it is funny sometimes, it's more of just a slice of life stuff, and Fruitical Alternative is funny for some of the show before it turns into a drama, um, whereas Nining Gashinobu then is just a straight comedy the whole way through, and it is very funny. Um, I just, for some reason, have not finished it, so we're going to try and blast through those episodes now, and then I think I might watch Chubura, because that looks like an interesting show, and I remember hearing people talk about it before, and they said it was funny. I think, right? I've I've heard of th I have heard of Chubura before, and that makes me think it's probably good, because the only times I hear about anime are if it's either especially good or especially bad, and uh, I don't think it's gonna be especially bad. But we'll find out. I've been wrong before. So let's watch Nininga Shinobu then. You know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna reveal my power level. Probably shouldn't, but I'm gonna do it. You forced my hand, okay? Um, I, not to, not to big myself up too much, but uh, I, I'm an artist. I'm something you might call an artist, right? I make music. It's like one of the main things I do in my life. Productive output, make music. But I have some fairly hot takes about the nature and purpose of art and the position it should hold within society that uh, most artists really don't seem to agree with. Um, I've talked before about copyright abolition. This is one of my most passionately held beliefs. Um, but honestly, that doesn't even begin to break the surface of my opinions. <laughs> I have called myself before an anti-art artist. Um, I don't necessarily believe that there should be a separation between art and life. That they, sh they should be. The goal, at the end of it, is to make them one and the same. So, um, nonetheless, let's talk about AI real quick. Um, you, you, I already made a video about this, but that was kind of just a quick video mainly focused on copyright and the concept of intellectual property ownership um, but uh, I want to dig a little deeper into it why do artists feel I'm also going to talk about a possible political policy yes, proposing actual policy that uh, in my opinion would, would help fix art um, and if you make art you're probably not going to like it <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. So, um, uh, if uh, AI, right, AI make painting, make painting the look about as good as your, 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 all of the internet artists who draw epic, uh, HD realistic Bowser with lasers artwork, you know, but nonetheless, it also draws, you know, if you ask a, 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 one of these like Dali to draw a painting of something in the style of Picasso, um, it'll actually make a pretty passable Picasso. Um, and you know, th th this is, this is, uh, arguably art with more merit than epic 3D Bowser with lasers which is most of the artists who are complaining about AI are these sorts of kind of weird corporate artists who make um, very cheesy, corny art that I don't particularly like. But just because I don't like it doesn't mean it doesn't have merit. But nonetheless, my point being, you can't just write it off as, well, AI is only making this particular kind of art. Because I'm sure, I guarantee you, in a couple of years, AI will be making music that is as good as my music. <laughs> I, I, it's it's going to happen. Anyone who sees this as a bad thing is a fucking idiot. The more art in the world, the better. The more free and created the art can be. I can't imagine anything more freed from, from you know, freed and creative artistically than art that isn't even made by a human mind. It's made by a machine intelligence. I know, you know, that machine intelligence itself was crafted by a human mind. It's really just human-made art with extra steps. But um, nonetheless, there is some, there is, which is arguably the entire purpose of art, there is a noticeable, non-negligible percentage of that art that is in direct contact with the outside, right? With this no, a, a, a abject non-human intelligence participated in the creation of this art, as, as well as a human intelligence which uncovered that non-human intelligence. Yeah, you want a funny section in your video? Go ahead. I just woke up and I heard you talking in this room and since like the room ambience is completely different to like any rooms you're normally in, right? I was like, who the fuck is that? Because <laughs> you sounded completely different. You sounded like a posh British guy. That's basically what I am. Yeah, but oh, oh, did you also just wake up? Yeah, well, I woke up a little. My, my voice is still wake up. Yeah, yeah voice. you have like morning voice yeah. and dream ambience. You just sound like a push with this guy. I will. I assume you don't want to be on the video with yeah. bed hair. I'll go into the other room. I'm coming back. I just need to walk through. Oh, okay. I don't know what I'm doing. There was the dotes my interlude. So, to me, right, and, and I haven't, you know, most of this art. Um, there's been like some Dali art that has genuinely impressed me and to some small extent, you know, nothing's changed my life yet, it probably will one day, but there's been Dali art that has, to some small extent, caused a genuine emotional reaction and moved moved me. Like I saw a Dali art that was um, a painting of uh, the Russian Revolution in the style of, um, I forget exactly who, but a, a, a guy who painted the French Revolution. And it looked genuinely amazing. Like, I, I, I would see that in a museum and I would think it fit. <laughs> like, it was a it was a, a really, good, genuinely a good piece. I mean, it wasn't, like, necessarily the style of art that I particularly, like, super love. You know, I, I like, well, I like a lot of different styles of visual art, but... Nonetheless, I was impressed with it. I, if I if someone came up to me and said I painted this, I would have been like, "Damn, you're you're a good that that's a really good piece." And I felt that too, you know. Um, to I, anyone who sees this as a negative is is a fascist. I'm sorry, you're a fascist. You're you're control. You're you're trying to control and limit and organize um, intelligent production and and the art. Creativity, human and inhuman creative forces, you, you're there trying to, um, you know, AI is, to, to, to go all Deleuzian for a minute here, AI is deterritorializing the creative, the creative process, which is like 
the whole thing to lose likes, and then you're here like, no, no, let me re-territorialize it. You're, you're, you're a fascist. I'm sorry, you're, an, you're a fascist. And the reason, obviously, behind all of this is money. These artists, they say it is a threat to their job. Oh, if you can just open an AI and type in furry porn, then who's going to donate to my Patreon? If you can open an AI and type in, you know, uh, epic Bowser with lasers art, hyper-realistic, then who's going to donate to my Patreon? Who's going to pay me for commissions? Right? You know what I've never, you know, it, even, the, the AI weirdly sucks at drawing anime girls. Also, Still. also um, there, there needs to be a large distinction between artists and the illustrators. This is, this is facts. It's, it's mainly, it's a lot of illustrators who are very mad at this. But artists are mad at it too. And mm -hmm. they, they are, I've seen it on Twitter. There are, there are some, like yeah. there are a lot of artists retweet the illustrators who make the original yes, tweets yes. and like expand upon it and be like, this is a threat to my career, blah, 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 right? You're, if you're an artist, AI will really make paintings that have substance. I think, this is why I disagree with you. I yeah. think AI already has made, as I said in my, already. I mean, yeah, but the substance in AI is incidental. I, I disagree. As a, my argument, to repeat it, for the, the, even though you guys already heard it, my argument is that AI, the, the, the systems, are still created by a human. It's yeah. still human art with extra steps. However, also, it includes some small element, which will only grow larger, yeah. of inhuman intelligence. Yeah that produces that artwork, mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, part of the whole point of art is to experience the outside, I mean, right? That's, that's true, the, like... the, if, if an AI, if, if, which is the outside, mm -hmm. is partially generating art, mm -hmm. that is arguably more art than anything a human can create, to yeah, some but extent. Like, but like, my point is essentially, like, if you're a painter, you're never gonna get intentional brush strokes from AI. It's not actually a threat to you. It's just. I mean, I, there's no threat. It's art. It's not. This is. Yeah, the but what I'm saying is that you're never going to be replaced by AI because AI can never actually do intentional like brush strokes and stuff like that. What do you mean it can never do intentional brush strokes? Because like if you the the thing that makes looking at paintings in real life good, right? Going to an art gallery. Oh, it can't do like uh, impasto. You mean? What's it's the texture of a painting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, it can do a texture of a painting, but it can't do so intentionally, because to me, at least, like the texture of a painting is like the coolest part. I, I mean, a lot of people agree. Um, I, I also, I mean, I it think depends. Maybe like certain degrees. Yeah. Um, I mean, different different painting styles have different levels of impasto. That I are, mean, impressionist. Yeah, exactly. Impressionism is one of the main things where impasto was like a big deal. I like and impressionism a lot. Me too. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. You went to a Tate and there was an Impressionist painting and you were like, this is boring. I didn't like one painting. That's fair. I like a lot of Impressionism. But it was, a, it was a nice Impressionist painting and you were like, boring. I didn't like one painting, okay? It doesn't mean I, does, I don't like the whole movement. I see. I mean, you like abstract Impressionism. I do like abstract Impressionism. I just like regular Impressionism. I like both. I like it both. I'm honestly not much of a paintings guy. But I'm saying this with regards to the idea that AI in one or two years will be making music as good yeah. as it's making paintings right now. And that's, yeah. I, I, I mean, whether it does or doesn't, it doesn't matter, because yeah. it will happen eventually, whether it's one year away or ten years away. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, I like this, and I think... I mean, the thing, the thing is, is that the AI language models like, still need like at least a year or two to make like lyrics, and AI music models I need, like... <laughs> at the same amount of time to make music and then that's just a starting point where AI is able to generate music I mean, I, I think AI language models could already make music mm -hmm. like the GPT-3 language models could I definitely mean, make lyrics 100% mm -hmm. they can make poems I've seen them do it they, they can, can make, make and they can make good poems they can make interesting poems yeah, that's all it all has to be that's true I, you know, I don't, I don't mind and here's the I think here's a, a very big um contention with what you have to say, which is going to go into really the point of this video, is that you use the word AI is not going to replace painters, right? As if 
not to go too hard on you, right? I don't mean to own you epic style, but as if art is a zero-sum game, as if an artist can be replaced, as if art itself can be replaced. It can't. It's, it's, it's not something... It doesn't work like that. And you know, we only think it works like that because, um, as I've talked about a billion times, the art and capitalism are incompatible. They don't... You, you can't use the, the, the same profit model to commoditize art as you can to commoditize, I don't know, something that isn't art. But ultimately, everything has some artistic merit, and so everything, you know, this is kind of the absurdity of capitalism. But nonetheless, let's get back on topic. What, do you remember what I was talking about when I came in here? Okay. Um, so yeah, this is the whole, the whole idea, right? Is AI is going to put me out of a job, it's, it's the same thing that's been happening in other industries for, since the beginning of, of human, uh, since the beginning of technology. It's what technology does. These artists become like neo-Luddites the second it comes for their career. Whereas, you know, it, when, when truckers are put out of a job by, by uh, fucking uh, uh, automated driving stuff, uh, you know, people are like kind of sad, but they're also like, well, we can't do anything about it. They're like learn to code, exactly. I don't know if it's the same artist, but I bet these are all middle class people, you know, they, they probably don't really care much about truckers. But oh, all of a sudden it's coming for artists. I'm mean, terrified this you know, is like the Marxist utopia, like the classical Marxist one, where it's like automation will do everything except for art. Yeah, the, the, this is, yeah. this is, it's just that their fantasy has been proven wrong, and Nick Land's been proven right, and Deleuze has been proven right, that like AI is ultimately a creative force. Right? It, it, it's best at doing... It's good at doing creative stuff, not just automating stuff. That's the difference. You've only seen technology, pre-intelligent technology, that is good at just doing uncreative, um, patriarchal work, right? Hard oh, machines. Yeah. Now we have these soft machines that are doing creative stuff. They, they are, they are they're creating... They are bringing stuff in that has previously been outside, and the artists that want to keep it outside, they want to, you know, keep this art space from being deterritorialized. They're fascists. I mean, we've been saying this for like the last few years that AI is just better than everything than humans. And if it's not yet, it will be eventually. Yeah. This is the, this is what I yes. And now I will propose my solution, my actual political policy. Yes, that's right. No, thank you. About to propose policy changes to solve a real world problem. I know, it's unheard of. And you're not gonna like it. I'll tell you, you're not gonna like my policy changes because because you're you're a capitalist, you're a greedy capitalist, even if you don't realize it. And the more socialist you are, the more you're actually a greedy capitalist. Um here's here's my belief. So we all know. So the problem with all these artists, right, is that they see AI as coming for their jobs. They're coming from right there. These immigrants, these immigrants from the, the machine, the machine at consciousness are going to take our jobs, right? That's, they're, they're, they're just fascists, right? These immigrants from the machine at consciousness are going to take our jobs because, because they see art as a job, right? And they see the end product being produced for, for, for less money, cheaply, and equally as good by machines. And they've seen how it happens in history, you know? When, when that happens, you lose your job at the factory. You, you know? Also, you know what's fucked? What's fucked? Illustrators will have their jobs taken away before truckers. <laughs> That's true. Truckers should have their jobs taken away. Not by AI driving systems, though. By high-speed rail networks. I wanna... I, I wanna be a trucker in Italy. It'd be cool. You can just play the Euro Truck Simulator. It's literally better than yeah, real-life trucking. Yeah, but you don't get paid for it. You shouldn't. I trucking isn't get... art. I want to get paid for trucking. I see. You can get paid in in-game money. Yeah. And you could stream and get paid for it. Yeah, but you know how the saying goes. How does the saying go? Born on a mountain to place in a cave, <laughs> trucking and fucking is all like crazy. It's true. Yeah. Okay, but here's my policy change, right? So all of this stems from art being viewed as a commodity, right? Because we have monetized the wrong part of art. Um, because, uh, which wasn't revealed to us until digital technologies uh, allowed for free distribution of information with almost 
the word negligible labor, right? So beforehand, if you painted a painting, right, you sold that painting. That was how it worked. You sold the painting and then someone made, gave you money. So you did the actual work for free, right? You, you didn't get paid for painting the painting. You got paid for selling the painting. You sold the painting, but then that was the only painting. And so it made sense, right? Because the, the, the product and the process were very closely linked. But then digital copying came into play. I mean, this has already been a thing since people could actually, and it was actually very common for people to copy pre-existing artworks um, as a study and then even sell those. Um, this happened, I, I, you, you see a lot of copies of, of original, more famous paintings that understudies do to a very high degree of quality there's and then they sell them. There's a shit ton of copies of the Mona Lisa. Like a shit ton. Yeah. There, I mean, there's a shit ton of copies of every, even like slightly famous, like even... No, I mean like contemporary copies of the Mona Lisa. I, I know. There's so many of them. There's, there's, th this is what I'm saying. There's, yeah. there's a, uh, and this isn't a bad thing. It's not like they're forgeries. Yeah. They're, people need to learn to paint somehow, mm -hmm. right? And paint, learning to, you know, studying how someone else painted something that looks good is a great way to learn to paint, right? If you mm -hmm. do it yourself, you, ah, so if you do this technique, it will have this result, right? That's... Are very common. That's why I make covers in music. Everyone does this sort of thing in every field that requires some level of technical knowledge. Is to you know even like cardistry, right? You you learn other people's moves first, and then you go and create your own. That's music. You learn other people's songs first, and then you create your own, right? This this sort of thing. Um, uh, but nonetheless, because copying a painting by hand is still a very labor-intensive process, and it was still very easy to tell which was the copy and which was the original. Um, you could still justify this um, commodity form of art where the painting itself is sold and the work is done for free. The labour is done for free. Um, but then digital files came along and suddenly a painting didn't take a month of careful copying and painting to, to, to reproduce, just like a book no longer took years of careful copying and writing to reproduce. It just took the click of a button to reproduce. It took no labor at all, almost no energy, it took almost nothing. Reproduction was suddenly instantaneous and free, essentially. Um, and this fucked everyone, because suddenly, um, you know, this whole model that had been around and had been broken the whole time, just no one had noticed, suddenly its flaw was, was realized, that we have been paying people for the wrong part of the art process, right? We've been paying people for selling their commodity, right? But in the space where that's digital art, what we're doing is paying people to remove artificial walls around a file which can be freely distributed for free with, with no labor or any cost at all, really. You know, such negligible costs that it's not even worth mentioning. Such negligible labor that it's not even worth mentioning. Um, and so artists, you know, have to kind of forced to put up a paywall and even you know they, they basically use either uh, law to protect themselves copyright law or you know some people didn't even you know they to solve this problem they think nfts are the answer the only solution and this all comes you know but at the end of the day that's the same thing whether the thing that says this art belongs to you is a, a smart contract in the ethereum blockchain or if it's uh, a, 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 a law somewhere in a government office, it doesn't, or a patent somewhere, right, or whatever, um, it, it, it's equally meaningless because they're both just artificial stamps. There's no actual property rights, like there's nothing that, that would be similar to the, the more naturalistic property rights, like personal property, if I have a toothbrush and I'm holding on to it, you can't just right-click, copy, paste my toothbrush, right? That's in that sense, property seems to follow naturally from from object, but in the case of digital files, property doesn't make sense in the same way because my property is my hard drive, right? The physical thing that's storing the data, and so anything on that hard drive automatically becomes that property, a part of my property. Um, and so suddenly you have this situation where, you know, artists have to create their art for free, right, and then um, put the art online, which takes no labor, 
and put up a paywall, which takes no labor, and then they get paid for taking down the paywall, which also takes no labor. All they're doing is hiding their art from the public view and from sharing it with people because they haven't got a good way to um, make a living otherwise. So my policy change is thus. Um, again, this is fairly radical. It should be illegal to make money from art. Here's what should happen. If you're an artist, you should go up to a government office, you write them a, a, a letter or something, right, an email, that says, hey, I'm an artist, give me, give me the artist treatment. And then they pay you in free housing, free basic food, and free basic art equipment, and free transportation if needed, right? Or at least very heavily subsidized to the point where it's much, much cheaper. But no money. You cannot make money off of art. You can only live a very simple, basic life. You can only get the minimum you need to survive. You get food. It's not like starvation level food. You know, it's not like watery soup and, and stale bread. <laughs> you know, it's like basic food amenities that are, you know, you will keep you alive and well, but not lobster and caviar, right? A basic housing, a small apartment, probably. Um, basic public transport, you know, not not a luxury car, um, and and basic equipment, you know, you can probably petition for a more expensive equipment or get a job and buy more expensive equipment, but it is illegal to be paid to make art. The government gives you these resources you need to survive and nothing more, and you make art and you make the art public because making art itself is the thing that you should be doing. <laughs> that is, um, there's a word for it, but I've forgotten the name for it. But, uh, that is like, that is the, the, the act of creation, right, is providing a service for humanity and for inhumanity. It's, it's, a. Uh, um, and well, why, why should, why should the government not just pay you a stipend, right? A, a stipend, stipend, or whatever. Like, why should the government not just pay you to uh, a wage? Well, wages are problematic for their own reasons, but um, because, it's very simply, all of the things that are bad about art happen because of people who are trying to make money off of art, right? There should be no Disney. It shouldn't exist. There should be no Disney. There should be, there should be none of these big art corporations, right? It should, it just shouldn't exist. Um, there sh and, and all of this stuff that's bad, right? All of the copyright trolls and, um, you know, terrible pop music and, and all of this stuff only happens because people want to make a lot of money off of art. If you make it illegal to make money off of art, suddenly all of these things disappear and art is suddenly freed from the burdens that it once carried. Art itself becomes money. Whoa. Whoa, holy shit. I know, right? You get rid of all of these people who, who, who are only, you know, these illustrators or whatever, who are like, AI's gonna take my job, it's gonna take away my my, 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 my 50k a year salary. Yeah, you shouldn't be getting a 50k a year salary for drawing epic Bowser with lasers, right? Like, fuck off. No one, you're not useful. You're not useful to the human race. Biofuel, 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 okay? Biofuel. We're gonna turn it with biofuel, right? You, 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 you guys wouldn't be motivated to make art in the first place because you have nothing inside of you. You have nothing to express or create. There is no, there's no difference between the world as it is and the world as you desire it to be. You have your, or all of your desire is so entrapped in, in, uh, encased, right? That, 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 the artistic medium has nothing to add to your life. You're doing it for money because you think it's better than working at an, an office job, right? Or, or a service worker job. You're like, well, I'd rather be drawing Epic Bowser and, and doing, uh, super flat illustrations than than working uh, at Starbucks, you know, 
those guys have to unionize. <laughs> right? The you, you people should not be allowed to have a career in the arts. There should be no such thing as a career in the arts. You should just, you know, if you're an artist, you get a, you, you, you're basically just, you get a place to stay and enough food so that you don't die. And transport costs if you need to go gig somewhere, right? And I would take that up in a fucking heartbeat. You know how fucking, that would be, like, if that was an option for me, this would be, like, instant. And a lot of my friends, too. A lot of the people I know that make great art, and some that I don't that make great art, I'm sure they would take this opportunity in a fucking instant. And it would be super cheap for the government. I mean, just cheap food and housing, it's not even a, a big expense, you know? The amount of people who would actually take it up, it's probably nothing. Right? This would be... A revolution in in art and all of the people like like these epic bowser drawers and and all of these you know illustrators and all of the the, the corporations they would disappear overnight they would be like i don't want to make art if i can't get rich what's the point of making art if i can't get rich and there you go because art itself is the wealth and this is not some like you know there's this idea of like under capitalism the jobs that are actually useful to society People make this excuse like, oh, well, teachers don't deserve higher pay because the job itself should be a reward, right? Um, in reality, no one deserves pay. <laughs> uh, art is not a job. Art is something much bigger than jobs. And yes, if no one ever paid me to do art, just like no one ever did, right, for, for a long time, I would still be doing it. And I am still doing it. Because it's not some, it's not, you know, and just like if no one ever, no one's ever paid me to teach anyone anything, but I still teach people stuff because it has value in itself. It has value that it, it is money. And um, eventually, any form of capital that is like a potential, if it can't be accurately, okay, we all know that the current state of art is going to collapse. It's, it can't hold itself up with the internet. It just can't. Like, unless... There's only two ways that it collapses. It either collapses into fascism, where the... which is seeming fairly likely, right? Where all of the internet is hyper-controlled. You don't own your computer. You just rent space on some corporation's cloud server, um, and your actual computer is, like, nothing or whatever. Uh, you don't own anything, and therefore you can't own any, like, pirated uh, anything because you don't, you know, they, they, they just kick you off. There's, even, there's this image that gets shared on, on various technology sites where, of like a, a, a Windows error that is like Windows saying, we detected pirated software on your hard drive, you should be, or, or pirated movie or something, like you should get rid of that, um, telling you, giving you a stern warning for, for using your own computer to do whatever you want. That's the one option, right? And that solves the problem, because then you can still keep pretending that art is a commodity. Somewhat. You know, there will always be Linux users or whatever who can get away with it, but if the internet is, if the splinternet is more controlled, then so on, right? And then there's the, the second option, which is capital realizes, or has already always known, that art itself is another form of money and can't be reasonably transferred, or you lose something in the, the energy transfer and that's inefficient and so there you go just like you uh pay a technician to keep the the money printing machine going but you pay in food the technician who is the artist to keep the ai that is in their brain going Brr. you know what i'm saying yeah no one should ever make money from art uh fuck everyone who says ai is bad um, if AI if AI replaces me, I'm gonna make friends with it, and we're gonna replace me together because I want nothing more than to be replaced. Are you kidding me? While I've been here, I've been looking for a game that uh that I can play with just my keyboard on my ThinkPad, and this is that game. I finally found a good online game. Right, this is what I wanted. I wanted like. A somewhat competitive or at least tech based right something with tech uh, in it right that I can play 
on a ThinkPad with a keyboard, no mouse, and it's online as well. Uh, and th I think this is it. Like, I don't want to publicize this too much because Nintendo will take this down eventually. Uh, but it, what it is is a PC port of this New Super Mario Bros. Mario vs. Luigi mode. It's not actually just an emulator, right? It's a, it's actually rebuilt in Unity um, with the same assets and, and whatever, including some like new user-made levels, which I think are really cool. Um, and it's essentially... How do I explain it? It's it's kind of a PvP kind of game mode where you you have to like collect various you have to collect stars faster than the other people collect stars and you can you know PvP the other the other people in the lobbies. Uh, it's a it's a it has some problems right like there's there's some kind of weird lag in terms of like the the inputs don't feel super clean. Um, like uh, I I don't really know how to describe it. Like you can't you can't dash dance in this game. I will show you how how it plays. It, okay, this only has two out of two. I'm 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 silly. Uh, these are all in progress. Here, let's join this one. Um, I will show you. You you cannot dash dance in this game, unfortunately. It's not Smash. But uh, just start. I also suck at this game, by the way. I'm really bad. I've I've never won, uh, but I've been playing it a lot recently. Okay, so uh, just to demonstrate. Um, so this is me. I'm Mario here, right? Uh, you, if I spam left and right, I don't dash dance. I just kind of keep going in the direction. You have to you have to go kind of slowly. You can't. Oh, sometimes it works, but yeah. Uh, and collect so collecting coins uh, is gonna get you power ups. Uh, there's my edge guarding. There's my bonking. Uh oh, I'm dead. There you go. And that's how you play the game. So I am watching The Expanse. Um, randomly, I remembered. Hold on a minute. I actually like sci-fi. I'm actually a sci-fi fan. My favorite TV show is Star Trek The Next Generation. And The Expanse is supposed to be the best sci-fi show of the last decade. Why am I not watching it? Um, well, actually, it was a little... Before I got to that point, I thought... I should read The Three-Body Problem, which and the other two books in that series, which I don't know the names of, but... And then I was like, well, since I don't have those, I'll watch a different sci-fi thing. Anyway, beside the point, I just want to complain about The Expanse real quick, which is silly, because The Expanse has a lot of great stuff going for it, right? In terms of everything to do with the world, right? It, in terms of production, it's really good, right? In terms of just the way the show is shot, produced, the sound mixing, it's a modern TV show, the voices are too low in the mix, it's yeah, a little bit fucking terrible and annoying, but, you know, the, the, the look of the show is very well thought through. So someone, somewhere, put a lot of thought into how these different places should look, right? Someone put a lot of thought into set design and a lot of money and effort into set design, a lot of thought into, like, how the cameras should behave. Like, you'll notice that whenever um, any uh, characters are in a, a zero-G environment, the camera's always, like, very subtly rotating. I don't know why I'm showing it. Like, if, it's in, if we're in zero-G, the camera's always doing this very subtly, more subtle than I'm doing right now, but sometimes it's not that says but it's always doing this even if nothing in frame is looks like it's floating or zero g or whatever it's subtle enough that you don't normally pay or it's subtle enough that you don't like notice it consciously that the camera's like rotating but it cues your brain into thinking that like there's no fixed horizon because the camera's rotating you know um like almost like the camera's floating freely in zero g as well it's a it's a it's good choices that there's good choices like that throughout the production of the show like um the CG is generally excellent. Um, they know like how to light uh, for CG and how to how to shoot for VFX in the future, so they will look good. 
generally speaking. I think the monster design is a little lacking, but it can be forgiven. Um, also, I'm going to be right back. Right, so where was I? Something, something. The production is generally competent and at best genuinely pretty good. Uh, especially in terms of like the set design and so on. Costume design is also generally... Man, it's not the best ever, but it's it'll it works right. And like when I say competent, that's a pretty high compliment because you know choreographing and shooting, uh, like a, a complex space battle is is pretty difficult because it's not really like anything the audience has experienced in their life, and it would be complicated even you know to understand what's going on for any person, uh, even if they were familiar with it from fiction. So shooting that to make it, uh, you know, very readable is, is, it's good, it's impressive. You know, Star Trek gets around this because they have the shield percentages, so you can always get an instant idea of who's winning or losing a fight, but that's not the case here, so it's more hard, harder sci-fi. But I'm not here to talk about the production. What I want to talk about being really good is the world. Uh, so anyway, the all of the stuff about the world is excellent. Um... Uh, like all of the the politics, the just the general world building is is really solid. It's very interesting. They have like an in, you know the whole film is kind of a uh, film. The series is centered between the sort of the three main factions, like the uh, Earth, Mars, and uh, the asteroid belt. Different factions, people who live in these different places. That's the only places apart from some moons that uh, humans have colonized. Um, they have like. Um, realistic ideals. No one just does stuff either on an individual level or more so on like a... Like, everyone's motivations are... They make sense. They're, they're, they're logical, right? Like, the the main people who live on the asteroid belt, their main conflict is essentially a labor dispute, right? Like, they're essentially exploited workers. Um, you know, and and so their behavior, their decisions of the the leaders and, and stuff make sense as that faction. Like, they, they behave in a way that makes sense, but they're also not just presented as sort of a, you know, a monolith. There's, there's shown to be multiple factions even within these factions who also have conflicting ideals for realistic reasons or at least understandable reasons, relatable reasons. No one's, generally speaking just a bad guy, except for one character who fucking sucks, but I'll talk about him in a bit. Um, but most of these people aren't just bad guys, right? There's, they're, they generally are just people with conflicting ideologies for good reasons. Um, and that's good. Uh, the, the way, like, ship battles, the way, the way combat works in space, and not just that, but the way the space works in general, right? Like, G-forces are a very important part of the show. There's no inertial dampeners here, right? Like, stuff like dealing with G-forces and oxygen and stuff like that that would be a real problem in space is handled. It's shown to exist. Um, uh, and, like, it's an, it's not just shown to exist. It's a pivotal part of the, the plot. It's, a like, you couldn't have... It's not something that they just shunt aside, right? When it's not practical to deal with. It's always a, a factor in every time when it would be a factor, right? Like, the way they deal with G-forces. And yeah, they have, like, this G-force juice thing that helps your body deal with it. Um, but th that only increases your resilience. It doesn't make you immune to G-forces. Characters do get, uh, like hurt and killed because they're pulling too high G's. The, the, like, all of this, this, like, the time scales, the, just, like, the actual scale of, like, distance t between planets, it all is, like, good and accurate and doesn't take away from the story. Uh, um, like, all of the world stuff, like, the way spaceships are set up from the way they look to the way they operate to, like, all of this stuff, I mean, generally speaking, it's all s really good fairly hard sci-fi. Um, one of the things that you might have heard as, like, one of the standout aspects of the show is that the the belters, the people who live in the asteroid belt, 
uh, have their own dialect of English that was made just for the show. They have their own accent that was invented for the show. They even look different because, you know, multiple generations down the line of being born, or like, you know, if you were born on the asteroid belt, growing up, you they, they look tall and skinny and fucked up, right? Because they have lived in low gravity their whole lives. And taking them on to, to Earth gravity is like, you know, can kill them and, and stuff like this. Uh, and it, it's all pretty realistic and good. And like the way Mars functions, it all makes sense. It's, it's, it's well structured, it's well told. It's never gone into like too much detail, like explaining stuff that, you know, it's better to leave unexplained um, versus just like leaving stuff out for convenience. They don't do any, like they, 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 it's all, it's very ha- well handled is what I mean, right? Like, and all of the grander plot, right? The, the, the broad strokes of the plot, the main complex of the show, like they're all really clever, interesting sci-fi concepts. I mean, the show's just full of interesting sci-fi concepts from the get-go. There's so many and they're all like genuinely interesting and fairly unique. Uh, it's, it's great. However, outside of the broad strokes of the plot, when you get into, like, the actual episodes and the contents of the episodes and the structure and so on, the show starts to fucking kind of show it's tearing at the seams a little bit. It feels like two things have happened here. The first thing that's happened is they haven't tried hard enough to adapt the book or the books. They haven't adapted the books hard enough for screen. There are scenes that play out and they don't make, like, spatial or temporal sense to see in person. But they're the sort of thing that you would read in a book and just sort of not even notice as a problem. Um, But when you see them presented in in a picture, in a video, in real life, they feel a bit clunky. Like, for example... Uh, there's a scene where one big guy holds back like 200 people from entering a ship and they pull it off as best as they can but they should have just adapted it harder and made it a group of guys because it doesn't actually like it doesn't make any physical sense the way it's shown in the movie or in the show rather like it it it, it the, the the physicalness of it doesn't make sense how can one guy hold back a massive mob from a fairly wide doorway like it it just doesn't it looks weird it looks like they're not really trying to get in which you know doesn't feel right there's a scene where like there's a protest going on and someone like two people sort of have a conversation in a in a space that doesn't really make sense where like the the police just sort of like hit them right and then leave them alone for long enough for them to have a short conversation, and then come and grab them again. Like, it kind of feels awkward. It's the sort of stuff that's just clunky to see outside of a book. There's a lot of examples of stuff like that. The other thing is the dialogue. It's kind of... Sometimes the dialogue kind of edges into, like, quippy one-liner Reddit Marvel territory, where... I'm not really Marvel territory, but, like... Kind of a bit too, like, quippy. The, the the sort of dialogue that's like no one actually speaks that way, you know? And that's not necessarily a problem of not adapting the book hard enough. It's just a problem of the writing. It, I assume that these are lines directly taken from the book. And it it just doesn't really fit. I just I just feel like it, it kind of takes me out of the show a little bit when people talk in this way. It's like a little too one linery, a little too, like, no one really talks like that. Um... Uh, the, there's and and the the sort of moment to moment uh plot beats are inconsistent some of them are amazing some of them are really great but some of them they feel they feel forced they feel like they're just injecting drama into a scene because they it's like a filler bit where they need to get from point a to point b and they need something exciting to happen in the meantime, so they just have a drama thing happen when it doesn't really need to be there, and it just feels kind of, it feels like it feels like filler because it's like you know they're not gonna actually, you know none of the characters that you care about are in danger, right? 
you know that like it's it, it doesn't this this whole scene is pointless because you know like they would never kill off a character like this right that wouldn't work in the story it it just feels pointless it feels forced and pointless sometimes um and I don't know. I kind of you can you can kind of give it a pass when it happens a few times, but it's like these all of these things I've mentioned are consistent patterns in the show, and none of them are like so egregious that I would call a show awful or anything. But they just happen a little too often for me to ignore. And when there's six seasons of this, it gets a little grating after a while. Um, another thing is, uh. I mean, there is a, a a bigger character who is just sort of evil for no discernible reason. I'm sure they're gonna give him a, a. I mean, I haven't. Maybe I just haven't gotten to his his big backstory moment yet. But he seems to be just like very like like unempathetic and like sociopathic in a way that feels out of place for the 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 humanistic vibes of the show. Like, other characters don't really act like this unless they have, like, a very specific reason. Whereas he just seems to sort of, like, really love war for no particular reason. It's hard to tell. Like, he's sort of self-sabotaging. I mean, he has motivations. They set it up. Like, we know why, like, on a vague level he wants to do what he wants to do. But it's not clear, like, why he's so passionate about it. Like... He has motivations, right? It's like, he wants to, to do this thing without spoiling anything. It's, it's a character who's in the Earth government. And he has ties with this one other character. And he wants this one... He wants, without spoiling anything, a, a certain technology type of thing to be used, right? And it's not clear why he seems so passionate about having that be the case that he is willing to act like a complete psychopath and, like, doesn't care how many people die in order for him to get this. Normally, for a character to act like that, they need to have not just motivation, but extremely strong motivation. But he just has... Mo- like, you know he wants to do it, and you know, like, kind of why, but there's nothing personal to it. There's nothing, like... I don't know, it just feels weird that he would act that way. It just it it's it just feels like he's just evil for the sake of being an antagonist. Um. Yeah, the show has its problems. It has its problems. Um. Uh, and like earlier on, in in like season one, they they kill off main characters, or like, they kill off characters who are not like super strongly signaled that they're about to be killed off, right? And then as the seasons go on, they seem to become less and less comfortable killing off characters. Characters get thicker and thicker plot armor. Like, the stuff that the main the main crew go through in season one, they escape it by the skin of their teeth and they're incredibly lucky. And they even mention this in the sort of the second big arc of the show, which is what I'm watching right now. Uh, like, from about halfway through season two all the way up to, I guess, I don't know when it ends, but the sort of second major big overarching plot thing of the show, they mention, like, like about how lucky the main characters are, but they don't actually address the fact that they're still <laughs> just getting really lucky constantly. They just have very thick plot armor. And that, it, it just, I don't know, I don't know about it. Okay, and one final complaint. The show is way too comfortable having space battles. Like, if you're trying to do hard sci-fi, which this show is, right? Realistic sci-fi. As the show itself has established, space battles are fucked up. No one comes out well from a space battle, right? It is incredibly destructive. You fuck up everything. It is bad. Space wants to kill you. You don't want to be in a space battle. And yet, people just seem weirdly okay with being in battles that could be avoided. In real life, in a situation like this, even if you were ordered to do so, I think, you know, people would be extremely tentative to actually fight in space. Because, you like, any logic, any two seconds of logical thinking 
will tell you how much of a fucking awful idea it is to start shooting at each other in fucking space, right? But they do it a little too much, and they do it a little too casually for how brutal it's shown to be in the show, and I don't know. It seems too easy for the main characters to win. It's like implied that their ship is like well, it's not implied it's sort of i guess the idea is right that they have this super op ship that they stole off of the martians they have a super op ship and that somehow means they're they're okay in all of these fights and that's cool but sometimes they're fighting other super op ships or <laughs> that are much bigger than them and then it just doesn't make much sense. I don't know. It, it, Star Trek showed us the lesson that sometimes two people trying their best to avoid a fight is way more intense and exciting and dramatic than just having a space battle. And I think that that's how space combat should be done. That, like, it should be... Maybe this is just my Star Trek brain talking, but I would like it way more if it was the character's trying their best to worm their way out of situations with diplomacy and stuff like this, or stealth, you know, not just taking the one-on-one -on -one fight as, you know, every time. Uh, and they don't take it every time, but it normally devolves into it, right? It's normally like they tried to avoid it, and it, but like, then they're not really doing it, are they? They're not really committing. I just think the writers aren't as good as Star Trek's writers, which is fair, but... Yeah, I don't know. It'd be cooler if they they could find clever ways to avoid fighting more often. Um, like, that's always more exciting to me than just watching someone with an OP power in an isekai, you know, use the OP power, is having someone who's an underdog and has to use creativity to avoid fighting instead of just being the strongest guy. Because then they're, they're not even the strongest guys. They just have plot armor. It's very weird. Now, I'm complaining about the show a lot. Again, as I said, all of the stuff that is outside of the characters and the, like, episode-by-episode episode plot, the broad strokes of the plot, all of the world-building, all of the physics, all of that stuff is top-notch. It's really kind of let down by the fact that the characters, they're just not as interesting as the show thinks they are. Their drama is just not as interesting as the show thinks it is. I sometimes feel a little guilty when I complain about shows being slow and boring. When there are... I also oftentimes complain about people complaining about shows I like being slow and boring. Um, I think there are times when it's a valid critique and times when it's not. There are times... And I the way I would narrow it down is... Um, uh, if, a, if a show is slow, and also at the same time trying to pretend it's not slow, that's when I have a problem with it. It seems, if the show is not using the slowness as a part of the atmosphere, instead it's being slow, but at the same time trying to, to add excitement, or pretend it's not slow, right? Like, something like my favourite movie, Tokyo Story, right? That's a really slow and boring movie. It's just people sitting in a room, nothing much happens. People talk, that's about it. It's slow as fuck, it's pretty boring. But, all of this is used to, because it's a celebration of mundanity. It's, a, it's about reframing mundane people's lives as, as something that is actually full of all of this drama. Something that could happen to any person, anyone watching the movie, could go through something, probably will go through something very similar at some point, as stuff that happens in those movies, or if you wouldn't, you can have a friend who would, you know, like, it's, it's very ordinary people's lives kind of stuff, and people's lives are slow and boring and whatever, and the, the movie is not trying to make itself pretend that anything, it's anything other that would take away from the point, it's about finding the the, the drama and the art and the, the powerful emotions in stuff that, you know, people go through every day in, in the experience of people that you might pass by on the street, you know? And that's really fucking powerful. 
Whereas in some shows, something might be boring. Yeah. You want some red bull? Um, I already have some in the fridge. Oh. I, I wouldn't say no to another, though. Uh, anyway, uh, in some shows, like The Expanse, for example, there are some episodes where there's an event that happens and then the rest of the episode is just kind of nothing. Like, they've got the main event of the episode over. They don't want to do the next event, right? The next big, like, plot-important event because, you know, maybe they... Let's say an episode's like 40 minutes, right? Let's say the first 20 minutes is spent on the build-up and payoff and the actions of the first big plot event. Oh, can I, can I... oh yeah, sure. Okay, so I've, I've heard this from, like, I read this somewhere where I, was, where I was looking at, like, analysis on what the ending of Monster signified. And uh, a person was like, a lot of, like, shows and stuff nowadays basically skip the product entirely, which is supposed to basically be the resolution of the wind down after the climax of the story. Mm -hmm. And that's, like, an integral part of storytelling is to, like, reflect on what the story means within the story itself. But since all of, like, uh, things skip that part and just end the show at the resolution, people have just kind of gotten used to it. So true. <coughs> facts. Absolute facts. I will tell you, this show has no third act, right? Whenever a big event happens, it just time skips to the start of the next big arc. Like, at the end of an arc, it just time skips to the beginning of the next arc. Yeah. That's a problem, I think. Um, and it happens on a smaller scale, too. Because... I think they're afraid that they don't want the audience to just have sort of slice of lifey moments with the cast. And for good reason. Mm -hmm. The cast are boring and shit. The problem is, right, the writers are the ones that are making them boring and shit by not characterizing them. You know, they're at their best when 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 they're like all of the crew of the Rocinante are in a fight or in an exciting scenario and they're all bonding together, right? They're bantering back and forth. They're all bonding together. This is like the best cast interactions in the show. None of them are fucking shouting and fighting at each other about bullshit, right? They're all, you know, getting along and crewing a fucking ship. And it's, and it's good and it's, and it's very entertaining to watch and it's satisfying. I don't think that... And there are a few slow moments in the show that aren't in the middle of this, but there's not enough. But even if there are enough or not enough, it doesn't matter. The The thing that matters is when there are moments in the plot where, as I said, let's say the first 20 minutes of the, sh of the episode is taken up by the single big event of the episode, th that's sort of over by the 20 minute mark in some of the episodes, I've like at least three of the episodes I've seen. That big event is sort of over by the 20 minute mark. And then... They don't want to start the next big plot event because they wouldn't have time to flesh it out fully in, in the 20 minutes. They wouldn't have enough time to set up because the show follows lots and lots of different characters. It cuts between lots and lots of different characters in lots and lots of different places and the events affect, the, the happen affect all of them. So it takes a lot of time to set up and pay off uh, any plot occurrences because you need to tell me what's happening to at least four different stories, uh, each of which contain, you know, five or so important characters uh, who also have to have their own, you know, they're not all just doing the same thing in different locations. They're also all doing different things, but they're all affected by each other's actions. Which is good. All of that, like that, the, setting a story up like that is good. That's really good writing, you know. And it's difficult to juggle that, and I, I agree. But you, end, you run into this problem where you've done the big plot thing for your first half of your episode. That's over now. Next big plot thing can't happen until the next episode. So you've got 20 minutes to fill, right? And you can't just fill it with nothing, you know, but you have to fill it with nothing. And so they fill it with... Drama that has no effect on the plot or the characters. They fill it with material that exists just to trick the audience into thinking that there's some sort of tension or suspense going on, when really it's doing the opposite for me. It's taking away from 
the actual storylines that I care about. It's distracting from it by by adding suspense where it doesn't need to exist. The most egregious example of this is, I, I already mentioned, they were already in a tense battle scenario, but the writers thought there there isn't enough tension here, and so they added some other bullshit where two characters are floating around in zero-g with tools flying everywhere and one of them has to replug the oxygen to another one's helmet. You know that none of this is going to actually matter. They're not going to kill off a character that hasn't completed their arc. Like, none, none of... You know for a fact that none of this is going to have any impact on the plot. There's no part of you that for a second is thinking, oh, I wonder if this character is going to get hurt here or, or, or die or something bad's going to... No. You know nothing's bad's going to happen because you know that the story couldn't move forward unless they got through this. So it's pointless. There are other times when the show is, you know, less predictable. Generally speaking, the show's pretty predictable, but, you know, there's also times when it, it throws enough curveballs to keep you on your toes. It's it's generally good about that with the, the broader strokes of the plot. Uh, but these little filler moments that just exist to inject tension into plot beats that shouldn't really have tension in the first place or should be downtime for the audience uh th- those ha- they don't work they don't work for me and there's too many of them and, and it's annoying you know i would much rather if you spent that, that time fleshing out characters without having them have to be constantly in drama with each other if you spent that time fleshing out characters or fleshing out the world which is what I'm really interested in you know like there's a lot of times when they will just like it's a pretty common thing in a lot of sci-fi modern sci-fi stories where someone starts spouting a bunch of techno babble and then another character goes in English please or something like that or like just give it to me straight cut to the chase you know and cuts them off I don't want them to cut them off I want to hear all the weird techno babble stuff I want to hear the details of, like, your report. All of the boring, nitty-gritty details of your little technical report about seismic incidents on this planet that isn't supposed to have seismic incidents. So, hold on, why is that happening? Don't just cut all the interesting stuff out and and surmise it in a a bite-sized chunk that the audience can understand. You know, like, I'm actually interested in the details here. That's the important stuff in setting up a world that I care about. So the the problem isn't slow paced storytelling. There's lots of really you know lots of the stuff I love are pretty slow paced storytelling. I'm constantly going on about moe anime that like like Gotchi Yusa and Hidamari sketches that have that are shows where nothing happens, right? Uh, but those shows embrace that fact. They are all about. They're called slice of life shows for a reason, right? They're all about just life happening. They're not about these huge universe d- shattering events they're about life they're about the characters just going about their day and you're there too to to ride along and it's entertaining right it's it, it and even in in shows that have you know grander scale to them like star trek for example star trek tng Similar, you know, there's thousands of people on the Enterprise that could die if something goes wrong. Or, you know, there's could break out in a war with with any number of the factions, the alien races that the, the Federation is not on excellent terms with, right? These are big stakes. And the show doesn't pull its punches when the stakes come to matter. But in between those episodes is Data's Day, is Lower Decks, you know, is there's all of these slice of life episodes that just exist to flesh out a particular aspect of the character of one character or a particular aspect of one element of the world you know like data's day is one of my favorite star trek episodes ever and yeah there's some tension b plot thing that happens just to exist but that's not you know even for star trek levels that's like really downplayed in the episode the main thing is just following data around as he has a day, you just fo- you just had a day in your, day in his life, and a bunch of funny things happen, and he just hangs out with people, and you see what life is like for him, and you get to know him better as a character, and through that, through his interactions with all the other characters, you get to know them better, and you get to know the world better, 
and you know you learn detail like in that episode you learn that that uh what's her name crusher dr crusher uh used to be a, a a dancer in university right that's never mentioned before or after in the plot i don't think but it it it's like and not only that did she used to be a dancer she used to have the nickname the dancing doctor and she's fucking embarrassed about it and she wants to leave it behind and she did tap dancing of all things and it's like that's that's a very amusing little character trait for her because you would you would not necessarily expect it but it also makes a lot of sense and it it's it it just fleshes it out. It gives you something else to care about about the character. There's nothing like that in this show. Nothing even close to that level of just like something that isn't there to move the plot forward or to generate tension. It's just there to make a character slightly more endearing, and uh, to have a funny moment or or uh, you know a, a weird little um, aside where two characters have a a funny interaction just because of the nature of who they are, where Data is a robot and she's a, a doctor who used to tap dance, right? Like that weird, or oh, an android rather than a robot, but like, just the, like the funny interaction between those two things. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent scene. I remember it from when I was a kid and I still remember it now. Uh, and I've, I've always liked that scene and it has no stakes. It has no anything. It's just a really interesting character beat that serves to build, you know, the the characters in your mind and make them more endearing. And if this show could do that instead of, you know, coming up with ways to make drama that um, can simultaneously trick the audience into thinking that something dramatic has happened while not actually having any effect on the plot because you're just filling in a gap before the next big plot beat. I, you know, I would much rather have the 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 world building or the character moments than than have, you know, dramatic cheesy dramatic movements swell and gunfights that don't mean anything. I've started reading. The Accursed Share by uh, Bataille. And I've got to tell you, it's tying everything together. It was like the... I feel like it's the final piece in the puzzle of like this... This... I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, first of all, it makes Nick Land make a whole lot more sense. Like once you realise how influential Bataille was on Land uh, and you, you read Bataille... It reframes land in a way that makes way fucking more sense than I than it, you know, than it did to me before. But that aside, Bataille on his own, like like the, the Accursed Chair is a really fucking good book. Not only is it really well written, but it's also just like really innovative ideas about economy that um, represent to me a paradigm shift in my thinking. Where he like even he re- refers to it as like a Copernican. Copernican revolution in economic thinking. Like, the Bataille's general economy is just a, a, a complete flip in how I've, you know, it, it, I've had these thoughts before, like, for a while now about, like, how, uh, you know, these things like efficient productivity uh, and, and, and stuff like this, like, focusing entirely on production... Uh, like many socialists do, or like Marxists do, just as a rule, is like somehow a continuation of capitalist logic, right? But I haven't really had the the theoretical backing in order to to really articulate that thought or to to provide a good framework as to how that thought makes sense, and that's what Bataille provides. And I think that anyone who's interested in I think it represents a sort of like, how do I put it? It's like this sort of combination of like Bataille, Deleuze and Guattari, Mark Fisher, Nick Land, Sally Plant, um, uh, maybe Sartre to some extent, maybe even Camus to some extent, uh, Foucault, like this sort of like milieu of like anti-fascist, anti-capitalist, but also not 
communist. Like, I, I don't know, I feel like it's the precursor to... Like, if I were to describe this whole postmodernist theory stuff, it's it's kind of like they looked at Marxism and they, they saw it go wrong, like, across the world, pretty much, and, they, they, and, and at home as well, you know, like in France. And they sort of were like, oh, we're actually way further away from this revolution stuff than we thought we were. Like, you know, the crossroads of of socialism and barbarism like everyone in the like in the 70s it seems like the french kind of thought they were at that crossroads but it turned out they were actually like a hundred years away from that at least and it's like all these thinkers or they were like oh we we were actually like we kind of got fucked over here and so it seems like they're laying a lot of theoretical groundwork like this is one of the things like like deleuze and guattari are sort of not even really offering any, like, political, like, I don't know, praxis or anything like that, although they they kind of are, in terms of, like, the monad, and, um, or nomad, I mean, and, and stuff like that, but they're not, it's not, like, you know, super concrete goals, in the same way Marxism, or, like, you know, anarchism, or any of these things offer, Right, there's they what they're doing is they're setting up like, I I suppose what, what they would call lines of flight, which I think is very important, um, as like the base of a political movement. But it's it's only the the very base which makes it kind of frustrating because I know like we're still, like it, it just takes it takes another generation of thinkers to come along and and add on to that and and build onto it in order to form it, you know, to understand, what one ought to do in this situation. And uh, that's kind of why I like CCRU so much is because they at least have started to do that. Like, especially in lands like Zeno Systems blogs, he, he talks actually a fair amount about political goals, um, although I might not agree with all of them. Um, but, but like, Land's whole thing, I suppose, like, the, the whole... I don't know. I, it's hard to explain. Maybe like Bong Chul Han is gonna is gonna is gonna be the one, or Fisher. You know, all of the, it's just about creating new new modes of thought. I think, it, which is important in the same way like the utopian socialists that came before Marx created these, and also Hegel created like the 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 cognitive preconditions for for socialism to take hold. Uh, I think it's going to be a much longer process, though, because this is much more complicated. Uh, but, uh, anyway, Bataille offers an actual, like, feasible economic, like, a, a feasible outline for what a good economic structure should be that doesn't look like capitalism or socialism. Uh, and I think that's, like, the the missing link that I didn't know about in the, this whole... Uh, group of thinkers, I suppose. It's like the, the, yeah, it's the missing, it's like, it's the thing that grounds it all in economic reality, in my opinion. Because Bataille is an absurdist, but he's also fairly pragmatic. Like, he's trying to solve real-world problems. Uh, I suppose all of them are in, in more of an abstract way, but Bataille is very much trying to solve real world problems but he's also an absurdist by nature of the fact that the real world is absurd i think that's good i like bataille go read the accursed share this is how i cured my mental illnesses i'm no longer mentally ill i'm actually perfectly normal now and here's how i did it um improve your diet there you go that's the first thing eat beans but the second thing is um a lot of people will tell you like, oh, if, you, if you're depressed or whatever, what you need is to work towards a goal. You need clear goals in your life, man. You need to be productivity maxing. And the actual answer is that this is missing the forest for the trees. You should not be productivity maxing, but you should be doing things with your life. But what you should actually be doing is um, being constantly interested in stuff. Finding stuff, constantly new stuff that you're interested in. Not because you want to reach a goal, 
Some people are very goal oriented and can do this and good for them, but that's not me. Um, uh, rather than doing it for the sake of reaching a goal or, or the end product, what you really need to center it around is, is reframing it in terms of just enjoying the process. Uh, I, I personally have never been able to do anything for the sake of an end product unless it doesn't take very long. Unless it's short. If it's short, like, for example... There are a bunch of albums to make albums. No, I made the albums because it was fun to make... To, the process of making an album is fun. The, the fact that I ended up with an album at the end of it just sort of happens. Um, and that's, I think, how you should get things done in general, is just do stuff because you enjoy the process of doing it rather than because you want a particular end product. Um, you will also be doing good philosophy if you do that too. A critique of revolutionary politics. Real political change has almost never actually come as a, a cause of revolutions. I, I, I don't think it happens. Uh, um, most political change either happens really gradually over the course of like more than one lifetime or it happens uh, very rapidly as a, as a consequence of uh, a technological innovation. So like the, the, the massive changes in how people in... Uh, I mean, I mainly know about England because that's what I've researched, like medieval to industri like early industrial, pre-industrial to post-industrial England. Like th that change was, was mainly a technological change. It was a, a development of the, the key technological development was the ability to transfer um, uh, heat, heat energy into kinetic energy. I mean, the main innovation was a container for it, that process. That's as in like a way to make use of, that's what it means to be no, able but, like, to do that. No, but the thing is like we were able to convert it efficiently before. How? But, um, with like Prawn Steam engines and shit. However, they couldn't no extend the heat. Them. The, the thing is, the innovation yeah. was the steel, not stainless steel, was the innovation in the production of steel, yeah. which made uh, a material resilient enough in heat to um, actually be able to harness the energy that we were but able it, it to happened, produce before. It, but the, the, this is a, I mean, the the production, the, the mass production of of steel is maybe a, a bigger deal than that. Yeah. Yeah. But the but thing I, is, like, steam engines only existed due to the mass steam, production. Steam of steel. engines actually happened. Like a lot of people misunderstand the industrial revolution as yeah. starting basically because of steam engines but that's not yeah. true the industrial revolution started in england about 70 years before steam engines became widespread actually maybe more uh b because of uh water mills mm -hmm. water mill driven factories uh became extremely yeah. and when even some windmill driven factories yeah. became but, extremely but like widespread the giant leap was like hey we've had this technology in steam engines for like a thousand years yeah and now we finally have a material that makes them possible to scale up that's true yeah um, so steel, let's say the, the ability to mass produce steel is the big technological leap forward there. It was the quality of mass produced steel. Okay, sure. <laughs> the, the ability to mass produce usable steel. Yeah, I'm a material sciences guy. I mean, that's good. Yeah. You, I need think, to be, you need to be a material sciences guy I think guy every sometimes. historical evolution in science has been due to materials being invented. I mean, it's true. Uh, and then the next big evolution the, it has been silicon, basically. Yeah. The, the ability to really effectively etch silicon mm -hmm. has been the, the, the big next technological revolution. Yeah. Uh, but, I, and you know, prior to that, you had um, <clears throat> obviously agriculture is the big one. Mm -hmm. um, but between like the, the from, from like the birth of agriculture all the way up to industrialization, there were lots of, there were lots of technological innovations, but nothing. That society changing. Yeah, the the thing is, though, is like uh, the, I, I every guess the principle we use right now, were, was invented like, like five hundred years before. They it, just didn't have the materials it could be for applied. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just materials didn't exist. Yeah, or they were prohibitively expensive. Yeah. Um. Um, but like, yeah, there was basically this the like all the way from, like, agriculture being invented to to the birth of industrialization. The main innovations that happened were just uh. That were actually capable of happening were, were pretty much the the um plows became much better like a roman plows sucked ass i forget exactly what it was that fixed that made plows better in europe than the roman plows but they they made plows way better um the invention of cover crops in uh like nor uh, northern france and yeah. uh, 
um, the Netherlands, they figured out cover crops, so you didn't have to furrow, like, waste an entire furrow field. Or, or Cover crops are, like, the best fucking thing ever, because it makes um, soil regeneration better, and you get a, a yield out of it, instead of just a farrow, like, having to leave a field farrow for a year, and you're not growing anything on it. It's, it's for, yes, uh, I think those are the two big innovations, really. And, I mean, there were a lot of innovations in building technique as well, um, like like architecture. Um, but those didn't really have massive implications for the average person. They were mainly just used to build better churches uh, or bigger churches. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that there was no... Tech- I mean, obviously the Romans had a lot of technological innovation, but most of that sort of uh, died when the Romans died. Uh <clears throat> like it, it just became impractical to maintain giant aqueducts and shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- these like rapid changes in human organization generally come as a result of technological innovation, and that technological innovation generally comes as a result of material innovation. That, would you say that's accurate? Yeah. And obviously it's uh, as an accelerationist I have to mention that it's a feedback loop right the more technological innovation you have the more you're able to technologically innovate Mm -hmm. using those previous innovations Uh, like uh, yeah Uh, or they you know sometimes they come as a result of natural disasters this is somewhat less common but still happens like the enlightenment only happened because of the black death Uh, I think this is I've talked about this a million times or like democracy liberalism only took hold because of the because so many people died uh uh in the the plague that suddenly every individual laborer was worth more if you right like if there's a smaller labor force each la- each laborer is worth more and therefore their collective power was massively strengthened and they could uh yes right also coffee don't forget coffee um but really revolutions don't play much of a part in it like the transition from feudalism to capitalism happened slowly over the course of multiple generations and uh, was only really formalised after it had already happened like people only started to formalise what the process had actually been after it already happened there's also something else to note which is um, the Roman Empire uh, a lot of people consider the, midi- the the medieval period they used to call it the dark ages because they thought that you know western european society had reached this great high in the roman era and then when the romans disappeared nothing happened for a few hundred years which is not true at all i the historians nowadays are very against this idea that nothing happened during the middle ages there were actually times of there, there was not actually any particular slowdown in terms of like technological innovation or anything like that uh, it just looked different, or they had different goals <coughs> and different material conditions, which I think is pretty fair. However, um, there is something to be said on the level of, uh, you know, it kind of disproves the progressivist view of history, right? Because there's no logical advanced, advanced like progression of advancement of societies when you go from pre-Roman to Roman to post-Roman, it doesn't feel like a linear progression, right? It feels like a kind of weird, uh, a, a kind of weird up and down, almost, where some things changed, but nothing, you know, necessarily progressed or regressed, it just changed. Uh, anyway, all of this is to build up to the idea that I am kind of warming to the, the, the theory that uh, capitalism is... Uh, really something more like a blip in the mode of of feudalism rather than this sort of grand evolution that is just going to be the case forever. That rather than, you know, capitalism, oh, it constantly evolves and and morphs, right? But it seems to be evolving and morphing into something that looks a lot more like feudalism than it did a hundred years ago. Uh, And this, uh, like, this idea of techno-feudalism, this guy... What's his fucking name? Greek Greek guy. Uh uh Yan Yanis Varoufakis. Var- Varoufakis. 
uh, him. Like he's got he 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 kind of came up with this. He wrote a book about it. I'm pretty sure. I haven't read it, but I've read some of his stuff, like articles and stuff. Uh, like he he kind of coined this idea of tech that that like capitalism is presently slowly devolving slash evolving into techno feudalism, uh, and people sort of have this like like instinctual understanding that this is the case, but but uh, he does a really good job of formalizing it. Um, like like uh, I think the the key like one of the key points that I didn't I still don't fully understand. I'm not well enough versed in macroeconomics to really understand the the processes that are going on here. I'm gonna have to do more research on it. Maybe those might knows more about it than I do. But the idea like this idea that like cap like the way capitalism is tr- traditionally defined, where private corporations grow and generate profits themselves. And that's what powers the economy. Uh, um, with the centralization of world banking, has sort of changed uh, post like two thousand nine, uh, with the World Bank uh, and the IMF and stuff. Where uh, now, like what happens is these these the, the entire global economy is is sort of propped up by central banks printing money rather than private corporations generating profit. Uh, like for example. The, the example that Yanis Varoufakis gives is in 2020 um, the UK economy fell by like 20% uh, the GDP fell by like 20% and yet stock prices rose by like 5% at the same time uh, that stock prices has, have become actually completely detached from the real economy and that seems completely insane to even suggest like how could that happen well how it happens is when the uh, the economy crashes, all of the stockbrokers know that the Bank of England is going to print a bunch of fucking money and give it to these corporations. And therefore, even though the economy has crashed, what's actually going to happen is these corporations are suddenly going to be pumped full of money that they didn't have before, and therefore their, their value is going to go up. And so they all bought stocks, they, they saw it coming, and they all bought stocks, and they were right. And the stock prices went up. Like this is what happens now. It's 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 no longer that these profits are just generated by the companies. It's more so that it the you know the the price of stocks and the value of these companies is just detached from what they actually do. Not to mention, you know, modern. I mean, this is happening. This has been happening for for a, for a long time now. But it's ever increasing with the tech sector, where tech companies can just sort of scam investors. Um, by making a bunch of bold claims and then never delivering on them, or this understanding that if you invest in a tech company, it might just never be profitable, even if it's incredibly widespread. Like uh, this idea of like how how a lot of these tech companies, like take Uber as an example, the way Uber managed to take over the world, their their business strategy is incredibly smart, but also very damaging, which is to uh, used a massive influx of investor funds to operate at a huge loss for years thereby undercutting all of the local market that they are uh, intruding on right they can they can just offer much lower prices because they're not actually aiming to make a profit they they they're operating basically entirely on investor funds uh and it doesn't matter how much they lose really uh and so obviously once the free market just doesn't operate <laughs> once you start doing that like you can just do anything you want then and so they could just offer these incredibly low prices and obviously everyone's going to choose to use uber and you just have to the only the bet is that you can keep doing that until all of the local all of the pre-existing industries in that sector can't afford to keep up with you anymore and they all you know die off go bankrupt you you offer such low prices that the local businesses or the previous businesses that took, that operated in that sector can't compete. They eventually run out of money, and then once they're all gone, you now have a monopoly over that market, and you can choose to start raising your prices again and make a profit. This happens all the fucking time. There's also situations like Twitter, uh, like Twitter, um, has like famously, despite how universal and popular and prevalent it is in a lot of people's lives it has famously almost like been really hard to actually make any money off now there's some debate 
as to how much of this is actually true, given that companies have a tax incentive to, you know, say that they, they actually don't make any real profit because you get taxed on profit. So if they can, you know, organize the books in a way where it looks like they're not making any real money, uh, but they actually are making massive amounts of money, then that's good for them. However, I still think it's fair to assume that Twitter, uh, you know, just as a business model is kind of a, a weird fucking business model, but they're propped up by investors, I think. Uh, I think a lot of tech companies are like that. Snapchat was like that. Um, Instagram was like that for a while. Uh, although it was propped up by Facebook rather than propped up by investors. But, uh, you know, they currently do. Facebook's currently doing it in the VR market, although it seems to be completely failing. Uh, they're trying to ma- operate these, like sell these, uh, undercut the entire VR market with ridiculously cheap hardware <coughs> in order to uh, create a monopoly but it doesn't seem to be working. So, And they don't really know what else to do, so they're just keeping on doing it. But anyway, none of this is capitalism. <laughs> like, none of this is the, a, a proper free market economy. I don't think anyone can actually say that it is. But even further than that, the other trend that we've seen is this growth of, like, as-a-service products. One of You may have thought about games as a service. Like, this is one of the big things that people complain about is is games games as a live service where rather than paying sixty dollars for a game you get a you get a game and then you have to pay monthly uh for it or not just games but obviously this happens across all sectors streaming services are one of the biggest examples of this but it's happening with everything that rather than framing it as a one-time cost where you buy a product you're essentially renting access to that product and my argument here is what is like feudal land ownership or even modern land ownership like what is what is renting what is being a landlord if not land as a service right they're the same thing it's just off like taking this product that is like uh nominally free like as in like like netflix Obviously, it costs money to to maintain the servers, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna hazard a guess here that they're making a lot more money than they need to maintain the servers. You don't think so? Um, I think most of their money is going into programming. A lot of your money is going into programming, but they've been operating in levels forever. I, I, but they say that, but who knows? They have been. They operating okay. That's that's forever. that's fair. Most of it is licensing for like a lot of it. like Netflix has fuck off server costs. Because it's like... Oh, yeah, streaming video is ridiculous. Yeah, streaming video is ridiculous. And uh, across the world, like, ISPs have been like, hey, Netflix, can you pay for some of our... That's, yeah, that's fair. And, like, that's why, like, the entire, like, net neutrality campaigns are happening. Mm -hmm. Because people, like, Netflix propaganda managed to make people, like, oh, somehow Netflix paying for their bandwidth is somehow a violation of our rights. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, they framed it as if the end user was going to have to pay for the bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, that ties into what I was just saying about companies operating at a loss and, you know, just not how the free market is supposed to work. Uh, like, these companies can just never make a profit or th- whatever, and it doesn't matter, and they just offer themselves as a service where profit doesn't matter anymore, right? Like, that's the insane fucking thing. Profit, the main primary goal of capital, just doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> the, the biggest companies in the world don't make a profit. Isn't that fucking insane? How does that make any sense? Uh, well, uh, feudal lords don't make a profit. Uh, aristocrats don't have a profit incentive. They just, uh, they have power preordained to them. Um, and it's not just you know, the companies that you might traditionally think of co- as companies. Like, the New York Times is a fourth-generation hereditary monarchy. Uh, like, it's... A lot, all of these, like, big, important, powerful systems and corporations and government entities and whatever are becoming more and more detached from the primary process of capitalism. And, you know, maybe capitalism itself is the factor that drives this, right? In in the same sense that, like, um, feudalism itself was the thing that, that ended up... What I'm saying is it's not anyone's choice, right? It's not like someone was like, I'm going to manipulate the markets and create techno-feudalism. 
what happened is the same as what happened in feudalism. No one in feudalism was like, I'm going to set up this system so that eventually uh, the wealthy merchants will have immense power. What happened is over the course of hundreds of years, the the like innate functions of the system just just ended up funneling money slowly into the hands of merchants or the mercantile class and giving them more power. And then eventually there was like the material circumstances of the Black Death and um, revolts in uh, Italy uh, that, that allowed the bourgeoisie to, to take power and ruin everyone, everything for everyone. <laughs> Uh, not that feudalism was great, but, you know. Feudalism, the main problem with living in feudalism was the famines every 20 years. <laughs> the, 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 the mode of social organization was was less of a big deal than the lack of agricultural and transport technology. Because a lot of these famines could have been averted if they just had trains, right? If you had trains then you can just get grain imported from somewhere else and it's no big deal. But transportation costs were massive, like, immense. Like, like you just could it wasn't effective. You couldn't even transport something, like, a, a large amount of anything anywhere. You just couldn't do it without, like, just insane expenses. But, and, you know, taxes uh, were, were probably not that much worse than they are now. Uh, I, I don't know. The main problems were technological, in my opinion. And they just didn't know what the fuck they were doing with farming. They just had no fucking clue how to farm. They didn't know what... I don't know how they managed this for, like, uh, hundreds of years. No one figured out how to do farming properly. It's actually insane how bad people were at farming. Like, the average return in in medieval Europe, or medieval England, is you plant... You basically would get four seeds for every seed you planted. Uh, which is just incomprehensibly shit compared to modern agriculture, which is, like, between 40 and 60 seeds for every seed you plant. Like, <clears throat> return of, like, 40 to 60 times versus four. Like, that's so ridiculously inefficient, no wonder there were famines. Uh, they just did, they just farmed really fucking badly. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why they did that. Uh, it, 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 you know, they, they just destroyed the fucking soil... I mean, people act as if crop rotation is this, like, magical thing. Crop rotation has been known about for thousands of years. They were doing it. They were doing it poorly, but they were doing it. I guess if you don't have any theory of, agri like, how agriculture actually works, like, how, like, botany, if you don't have any understanding of botany, it might be hard to figure out why your harvests aren't very good. But, uh... I don't fucking know, man. I reckon we could do a much better job of feudalism if we gave it a crack now. Um, but I think that the idea of this, like, revolutionary politics and stuff is just or applying the, the, the political turmoil of the 19th century uh, and 20th century, like, late 19th and 20th century, applying this political turmoil, like, universally, as if that's just how history is now, when, you know, in reality... That is a massive exception to most of history. There have always been times of like big social and political upheaval, but they they almost they don't generally last very long. And there's also an element by which I want to mention that, like communism, is. I I just want to bring this up as a as a last resort or like as a last little thing. Uh, because I can imagine some commies in my comments being like, well, the only, you know, techno-feudalism doesn't work, that Marx never said anything about this, how does that make any sense, or something like that. Like, th th I think uh, one of the key points about communism is that it's it's hyper-capitalism, and that might sound insane, but, like, everything about communism is capitalism, it doesn't revolutionise or, sorry, it doesn't blow up, it doesn't, like, completely negate capitalism. What it does is it's capitalism with all the bad stuff taken out, right? Like, land ownership under capitalism is, is kind of weird. Like, it's kind of a weird thing that exists. Or you could even call it, like, capitalist democracy or something, right? Like, liberal democratic capitalism. Uh, like, the idea of land ownership is something that's left over from the feudal era. It's It doesn't actually make sense under the logic of capitalism itself. Like, the logic of capitalism is all about exchange 
and uh, profit, whereas land, you know, doesn't really quite fit into that model. It's just a, a, a rent. It's, it's a lordship. So by abolishing cap, abolishing land ownership or, or abolishing private property, what you're doing is intensifying capitalism. In the same sense, you know, capitalism is inextricably linked with democracy. They both followed from each other wherever they went. Um, and uh, uh, this idea of like liberal social democracy, or not social democracy, sorry, liberal capitalist democracy, is uh, that, uh, you know, you, oh, all the people should have a say. So democratizing the workplace is just an extension of the logic of capitalism. Is what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's bad. Democratizing the workplace could be good. I don't know. I don't do work. My workplace is dem democratic because I'm the only one that gets a vote, and I'm the only one that works there. But <laughs> but uh, it's it's a it's operating still within the logic of capitalism, and that's why I, I like Bataille a lot because he he completely negates the logic of capitalism in his like general economy. Um, but yeah, there you go. There's there's some schizo rambles. Here in Estonia, I've seen a few people riding on these sort of I don't know what the word for them is. If there's like some sort of broad categorization for this type of thing, but I guess I could just call it a personal transportation device. Uh, electrified personal transportation device. I'm talking about like electric scooters, one wheels, boosted boards, the things that are like a unicycle that you stand on, Segway type things, you know, these these sorts of things. The hoverboards that were popular a few years ago. They're like massively gaining in popularity and for good reason, you know, walking is kind of a terrible way to get around like it's very inefficient on a on an energy level so of course people want better ways uh, but what i've actually found after researching these devices is something that i don't think a lot of people in, in that community have have discovered uh, which is that there's actually one particular personal transportation device that is like just going to completely demolish the market like it's so much better cheaper and more effective than all the other ones that i think it, it will just outcompete them uh, and once you find out about it, I implore you to to buy one because uh, it's just it just has it just solves all of the problems with this industry in such a clever and unique way that I think um, you know I think it's really gonna um, disrupt the industry. So th there's there's a few main problems with these personal transportation devices. Uh, obviously, one of them is battery life. Uh, they have to be battery powered um, and, uh, you know, batteries can only last for so long, so they can only really be used for short journeys. Um, and uh, obviously to, to maximize battery life, the batteries are heavy, so they need to be bulkier and bigger and heavier, which leads to uh, the second problem, which is maybe even a bigger problem. Uh, they live in this weird, awkward space where they are heavy enough that it's impractical to carry them around with you when you're not riding them but light enough that you can't just leave it on the street and people won't just pick it up and, and run with it. Like a car, for example, is, is obviously you can't pick a car up and take it with you, but if you park it on the street, you, it's too heavy to pick up and, and walk away with, right? And it's too, too big and, and noticeable to tow away, right? If you want to steal a car, you have to steal a car. Whereas to steal like a, a one wheel or something along those lines, all you have to do is pick it up and run away. Um, and sure, a lot of these devices do have some way to, to sort of lock them up, uh, but there's not that much infrastructure that's designed specifically for those kind of devices to be locked up and, and kept outside. And also, uh, again, with something as small as like, uh, you know, these like hoverboard type things, there's nowhere to store uh, a lock, right? There's, there's no easy place where you might keep a lock. You have to kind of like take a backpack with you if you if you want to go outside even just on a short journey uh, in order to keep a, a lock so you can you can lock it up and that's kind of impractical and and kind of annoying um, uh, so uh, yeah so the, there's these are the two main problems is that they're, they're, they're too hard to store once you're out and uh, the battery life uh, you know it dies and there's also kind of a third problem with them which is uh, just a, a related to the second problem, which is just that they lack infrastructure. They kind of have to take advantage of walking infrastructure. Um, but that, uh, you know, anyone who's ridden these things before knows that like, they're not really good to be on the pavement. 
you know, where there's too many people, you have to dodge around people constantly, you risk running into someone. And they're also not really good on the road where you risk getting run over by a car. But there's not too many other options. Um, uh, so what is this miracle product that I've discovered that solves all of these problems? Well, um, it's this, uh, you're not going to believe it when I tell you, because it's, it's this crazy new invention called a bicycle. Okay, now what a bicycle is, is it doesn't have any of these battery problems because it's actually human powered. You power it through pedaling and it transfers your pedaling energy from your legs uh, into rotational energy into the wheels, which then uh, via traction with the road propels you forwards. Um, this, this is actually an incredibly efficient process. And what this means is that these bikes, despite being quite large, can actually be remarkably light and maneuverable. Uh, which is one of these things that, that these personal transportation devices don't have. They're very heavy and bulky and not that maneuverable. Also, as an advantage of not relying on uh, electricity, they're purely mechanical. They don't actually have any electrical components. So what that means is uh, the, the, the responsiveness is just on another level. And you, you can even, you know, you can cycle theoretically forever as long as you have energy in your body, as long as you have food. Um, and, and it, they're incredibly light and maneuverable and versatile. And as well as this, uh, pretty much every city in the world has bike racks uh, that you can lock your bike to. And the form factor of bikes allows you to very easily store a bike lock on the bike as you cycle uh, in, in, in many different configurations. Um, and and the, the, the prevalence of these bike locks means that going into a shop or something is, is very simple. You just lock up your bike while you go inside and then and take take it back afterwards. And you don't have to carry a, a backpack with you or a bulky lock. It just attaches to your bike when you're not using it. It's honestly a genius invention. And, and third, uh, a lot of cities actually have bike lanes already specifically designed for this transportation method. Uh, there's already infrastructure there. And it also has this, this hidden fourth advantage, which is that obesity is a growing problem in the West uh, and actually across the world. Uh, and uh, bicycles are a great way to stay fit. They're a great way to get fit. So um, instead of spending your time and money investing in one of these stupid fucking personal transportation devices that uh, break in two years and aren't repairable, uh, that's another advantage of a bike. It's you, you can repair it very easily by yourself. Um, and all the materials are readily available. Good luck trying to buy the materials to repair your obscure personal device right like do you think the company sells spare parts i don't i don't know i don't think so how easy is it to replace the battery how easy is it to replace the wheels if anything breaks do you just have to buy a new one terrible design bicycles there are bike shops in every city across the world right and even regardless of that you, you can learn to fix them yourself and it's not even that hard um and the resources to do so are readily available and cheap and plentiful uh Honestly, instead of investing in one of these stupid fucking environmentally wasteful, fattening, dangerous, inefficient, battery powered devices, just buy a bike and then spend the rest of your time that you would have spent arguing on the internet about which fucking devices are. Oh, it's such cool tech. It's cool tech. Bicycles are better technology. People forget that technology doesn't just mean anything powered by batteries. A bicycle is still technology, and it's better technology than any of this stuff that Silicon Valley is trying to innovate in a space that doesn't need any innovation because the problem is already solved.
I made it back. Hold on, we gotta decopyright ourselves. We gotta decopyright ourselves. We gotta decopyright ourselves, okay. How the fuck do I decop copyright myself? Maybe that's good enough. Yeah, that's good enough. God, I didn't realize how much of a mess this place was. This place is an absolute mess. I flew back from motherfucking Estonia. And now I am alone here. And I've had no sleep, so I feel fuckeries. And that's the truth of the matter asserted. Um, you, you, you know what? I don't. I don't need any of this playing in the background. So, the flight back was somehow just awful. I don't know how to describe why, because the flight there was more objectively bad. The flight there, I was. I am a long. I'm a long, long man, right? There's a fact about me. I'm a long, long man. I got big legs, long legs, tall, right? I do not fit in economy class seating. I just don't. So the flight on the way there was just... I was just in genuine pain for most of it. Um, however, I just watched the first season of Tamayura, and it was great, and I just got absorbed in it, and it was fine. The flight back was better, theoretically, because I booked much further in advance, specifically so that I could get the the seats by the emergency exit that have extra leg room, right? And I got it, and it was comfy as fuck. I could stretch my legs out all the way. I was not cramped in the slightest. However, um... I was, I, what I was, was extremely paranoid about the battery on my ThinkPad running out halfway through the journey. Upon reflection, none of this makes any sense. The way I decided to go about it was the worst possible way to go about it. It was actually quite stupid. Not that it's necessarily a problem, but what I decided to do was... I've noticed that my ThinkPad's battery's been, been shitting itself recently, and then I actually looked into it on my way to the airport. I had, like, you know, power top and, and all of the shit that you can use to see how well your battery's doing. And it, it's basically running at 30, like, 30% 30 of the capacity that it should be running at, according to the factory. Um, so that's bad. Um, and, I yeah, I'd noticed it getting worse over the time while I was in Estonia. So, I don't know what caused that, but I guess it just died. But not dead, it, it, it's still, but nonetheless, my point being, I was paranoid about it. So instead of what I should have done is, when the flight takes off, open up the ThinkPad and watch Tamayura, he thought, um, sorry, Tamayura more aggressive until it runs out of battery, then start reading manga on my phone that I had downloaded, right? But what I did instead was the reverse. I tried to guess how much battery I would theoretically have. I thought, I'll read manga for the first hour and a half, and then switch to the ThinkPad for the last hour. What actually ended up happening is they made me stow away the ThinkPad for the last like 30 minutes or 20 minutes 25 minutes let's go with that it's in between the other two numbers so what i got was a you know about 40 minutes of of tamayura more aggressive which was a good 40 minutes don't get me wrong but at the time i was functionally delirious 
due to lack of sleep because my sleep cycle did not align with the plane cycle. In the lead up to that, I was just incredible. It was very loud. Here's one thing they don't tell you about aeroplanes. They're loud as fuck. And they don't have internet. So that, I'm okay with that. But I, but, um, I am prepared in terms of the manga I downloaded. Because I realized the only manga I had downloaded on my phone are ones that are, because I had, I had, you know, it was good, right? Because I was going slightly delirious from lack of sleep. And one of the manga that I happen to have downloaded is, uh, oh fuck, I have to Google it. I'm going to have to go on google.com and find, try and remember what the manga is called. Um, this, Ashizuri Suizoku, Suizoku-kan, Ashizuri Suizoku-kan, which I can now mark as complete, because I read all of this on the plane, and this, if you don't know, is the exact kind of manga you want to be reading when you're on dying of lack of sleep, because it's a surreal, dreamish, surrealist it's just like definitely surrealist manga it's very good it's extremely good highly recommend also everything by pan panya is great all of it, their stuff is is very good and i've read some of it but i hadn't read this one this is like an anthology series and it's very good so i read this but it's very short as you can see it's only 14 chapters so i finished that really quite quickly and then I was like trying to find the least lewd of the manga I had on my phone and each time I would catch up to one I would have to switch to one that was slightly more lewd and get more paranoid about people watching and eventually I just became delirious enough and from like the the constant noise of the engines because the emergency exit seats are right next to the wings where the engines are and those are the things in an aeroplane that make noise I'm not sure if you're aware of this but the noises in aeroplanes come from the engines so it was very loud and um, before you say something like why didn't you just put headphones on these are open back headphones they're the only ones I have uh, they do not block any sound from coming in from the outside really um, uh, but anyway so the, 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 the sleep deprivation combined with the, the constant noise and the cramped conditions on an aeroplane and also the fact that, I, I don't know, I had some, I, I mean, you know, you know how it is, um, just, just made me eventually stop caring to the point where I was just reading, uh, I don't know if, you know what, I'm going to hide my power level. Am I gonna hide it? I'll just say it wasn't porn, okay? <laughs> it was not pornography. However, the mangaka may have been involved in those sorts of things in the past. A mangaka by the name of Henry De, and if you know, you know. And that's a great manga, by the way. I'm caught up with it now. I was already pretty close to caught up, but I just had like four chapters left that I hadn't read. But that's a great manga. But yeah, I've, I've caught up with basically every manga that I had on my phone. And then, for some reason, I was just enforcing this thing that I wouldn't open up my ThinkPad until the last hour. It was very stupid, and very dumb, and very bad. And I didn't eat enough either. So I was also kind of hungry. And to be honest with you, I'm still kind of hungry. But the fact of the matter is... I don't know what to do about that, because obviously, having just been on holiday for two months, I threw all the food out, or I made sure to finish all of the food that I had in my house before I went on holiday, as one does. Um, so there's not really any food in my house, and I'm not in a state to go shopping. Um, so... 
basically the question is whether I'm willing to order delivery. I mean, I'm willing to do that. The question is whether it's worth it because I don't know if I'm going to fall asleep in the next 10 minutes or if I'm going to fall asleep in the next four hours. I think a good option would be to order takeout and then just, just, just not eat all of it. Just, just order a, a, a large portion of takeout too big to eat in one person and then just put it in the fridge and just have leftovers for breakfast tomorrow. I think that's the play here. So much stuff happened in Estonia, I don't even know where to begin in terms of stuff like my vape. I think an EMP went off at some point because my vape broke, so I bought a new vape. This was like 70 euros or something. It's pretty good. It's it's good enough. It has a really big tank, which I appreciate. Um, and then, just strangely, my Mac just broke like completely bricked as in like it's it the, like I would understand if it was like trying to boot and failing or something like that or showing some sort of error message or anything but no you you no matter what you do it doesn't even try to power on um so that's fucked so that's my mac gone <laughs> my mac gone uh so that's that um, yeah, it's just not ideal, is it? There's just a, there's just stuff that's not ideal going on here. Um, yeah. I recorded a whole bunch of clips in Estonia. You've probably just watched a bunch of them. Unless I decide to be Quentin Tarantino and put them out of order, where this is in the beginning of the video, but I don't think it, I'm going to do that, because I'm, I'm not Quent, I'm not Memento. Quamento. I'm not Quamento. But, uh, man, returning to London after being in Estonia, here's my review of Estonia. It's great. Right, Estonia is great for a variety of reasons. There's lots of great things about Estonia. Um, it's sort of just generally a high social cohesion society. Cost of living, low. Um, you know, like stuff like transportation is free. Just public transport is just free in the capital and cheap as fuck everywhere else. Um, there's barely any people in the entire country. Like, there's like... The entire country of Estonia has like 1.8 million people or something. It's fucking tiny. Meaning that the cities... Like, even the biggest cities in the country, you can just walk across them in like five minutes. It, they're, they're, they're fairly small. Which makes getting around very easy. You know, unlike London, where if you want to go anywhere outside of your, like, you know, anywhere notable, you have to get on a, a public transport for, like, to half an hour, which is not necessarily bad in itself, but it's not as nice as just being able to walk there in five minutes, obviously. The, the trade-off, I guess, being the things are bigger and allegedly better. I'm not sure about that, but... None of that really matters to me, because I'm not someone who really goes outside in the first place. Um, so there's stuff like that, like Estonia's like very high up on, I think it's like fourth in the world on the Freedom Index, um, which is strange to me because a bunch of stuff is illegal in Estonia, like uh, you can't drink on the street in public. According to Dotes, my I haven't double checked this, but that's fucked. Not that I'm doing much drinking anymore these days. Uh, although I would appreciate a drink right now, quite a lot actually. But I don't have any alcohol in the house that I'm aware of. But I would appreciate a drink. But I don't have any. But drinking on the street is not allowed. That was my battery.
um, anyway, that's something. But, but generally a good place to be, in my opinion. Good weather, it's cold, nice and cold. Uh, yeah. Dotswaite's house apartment thing has a fire, like a fireplace. Like when you want to heat the house, you just go into the, the shed and bring in a big thing of, you just grab a bunch of firewood and carry it to the fireplace and set it on fire. And that's how you heat the house up. And honestly, I think that that's how everyone should heat their house up. And it's kind of embarrassing to me that I'm coming back here where I'm reliant on energy companies to let me heat my own goddamn house. Um, I guess in a country like Estonia where winters are like minus 20, having, um, uh, very robust heating systems is is more important than energy company profits right like in the uk only old and sick people die from the cold in the winter normally uh so you get a situation like this is happening right now where energy prices and gas prices are massively spiking um meanwhile the actual real terms cost of these uh, or wholesale costs of these resources haven't actually, you know, they had a spike, but they're coming back down. Um, and these companies are recording record profits, of course, and no politician has any plan to legitimately deal with this, except Gordon Brown, of all people, who planned, who said we should just nationalise the energy companies and force them to bring their their prices down. But anyway, I digress. The point being... If something like this happens in the UK, probably a few hundred people, old and sick people, die, right? But if something like that were to happen in the, in Estonia, or, like, something, some sort of, like, physical disaster, like a pipeline bursting or something, some problem with the infrastructure, probably thousands would die. Like, that would be an extremely bad thing in the winter. You, like... Min you cannot live in minus 20 without some way of heating your house up. And so having a self-reliant system where people just burn wood makes more sense. To be fair here, I am basing this on literally being in two places in Estonia, two houses ever. Um, <laughs> one of which was on a farm. Uh, so... Maybe this isn't actually representative of Estonia as a whole. Not to mention, this house has fireplaces built into it. Shit. Like, like that over there? That cubby is a boarded up fireplace. There's one in the front room as well. Is this charging? Did I just break my cable? No, I didn't. That's good. Oh, man. But anyway, that's my th thing. But, but, okay. So, I'm singing the praises of Estonia. And, yeah, the, they have, like, a land value tax. That's pretty neat. They, like, there's there's a bunch of cool stuff about Estonia. Uh, kefir is, is cheap and plentiful. That's something I'm a, a, a big fan of uh, as a, a known kefir enjoyer. And lots of, like... A, but, but, here's the problem, right? Here's the big problem with Estonia. They just haven't figured out food over there. They just don't... Like, look... I'm British, okay? I know what it's like to come from a country that hasn't figured out food. The difference is, we knew we hadn't figured out food, so we made it the biggest empire in the history of the world in order to steal other people's recipes. Estonia has only ever been conquered and never... I don't think Estonia's ever even come close to conquering anyone. They've only ever been conquered. So they, they just kind of have shitty food. Except for, like, a few things. Like, uh... Kefir, as I mentioned earlier, they also have really good super dark rye breads, um, which I'm very into. Um, but other, you know, it's it's just a, Pete. No one that no one in the country knows how to cook, it and the the ingredients that they have are weird. 
it's just a, it's just a weird place where no one knows no one's fig they haven't just they just haven't really figured out how to do food properly over there yet but you know uh another nice thing about Estonia is the very low crime rate coming from London just not having to be concerned about walking around at night at all is very nice that's a very unique experience to me not something I'm familiar with as a generally paranoid person I'm a very paranoid person um, but but alas we are back in this country and the Queen's dead on top of all of it she couldn't handle it how am I supposed to handle it uh, so there you go I, I have some other stuff in the works you'll see that in the future but those are clips of Estonia